Good afternoon. I'm County Commissioner Jim Gibson, and I'm pleased to welcome you here with us today. This is a really big day. Uh, truth is, a few years ago when we began to organize ourselves and try and figure out what we're going to do, I was the least patient person in the room and concluded for myself that this just can't be. How am I going to settle into something that is going to take us this long uh, to get there? But I've learned something about myself as a, as a result of the process. Uh, I don't know that I would have been satisfied with much of anything that I see today that I love uh, had we tried to do something immediately. And that has to do with the way that maybe all of us, but at least the way I function, uh, grief is something that settles in and then seasons itself and becomes something different for me over the course of time. And uh, so for this experience, just like all of us in this community and across the world, as we've looked at what the experience has been for us, it's different today from what it was then. We really appreciate the, uh, the fact that you're here. And Commissioner Kirkpatrick and I have spent a lot of time uh, giving attention to both our own emotions and the emotions of uh, the community and the world as it relates to 1 October, and we appreciate your being here today. We're, some of us are wearing uh, the Vegas Golden Knights gear in celebration of the team winning the Stanley Cup. That's appropriate. Uh, the, we, know that, we know that you all understand something a little unique about the interplay between the Knights and the community. They have a strong connection to the events of 1 October. They helped us through some of the darkest times ever. And last night, delivering one of the brightest times ever was appropriate and fitting. The team was new in 2017 when it played its first home game uh, in its inaugural season, nine days after 1 October. In a very moving ceremony, the team paid tribute to the victims who died in the tragedy and also honored our first responders for their heroism. It was a very emotional night when our anguish was fresh, yet we were determined to be Vegas strong in our support of the families of the victims, the survivors of the tragedy, and each other. And the team also got very involved with the community, meeting with survivors and, and supporting events to help embrace those who were impacted. Now, six years later, your designs speak to our hearts in a similar way. It's clear when you look at the models and storyboards on display that each of the design teams involved in this process has worked very hard to incorporate ideas and input received from our community as a result of all the groundwork that members of our 1 October Memorial Committee have led over the last few years. You've seen us and heard us, and we thank you for that. But this journey of creating this memorial was intended to be a labor of love and healing and to respect the time it would take for us to get there, no matter where the people are on the road to that end. Our goal is to remember and never forget those who were taken from us. We also want to honor those whose lives were for, forever changed, whatever their circumstances or connection were, might be, to the event. And we know that this change that has um, been brought to this community is something that is natural. It was influenced by something horribly unnatural. But as we've responded in a natural way, we've figured out how to get to where we are. And now you're going to help us get the rest of the way. Each design concept is deep, deeply thoughtful and unique. I've looked at each of them and spent time trying to see myself uh, in my own response in the things that you've done for us. We appreciate the time and talent invested in what we have in front of us. Now let me introduce Commissioner Kirkpatrick to say a few words, and then Mindy Myers, Assistant Director of our Parks and Rec Department, will talk to you about the format for the presentations this evening.
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gibson. And I really want to say thank you to a lot of people that are here today. First, I want to start with our staff. Uh, you know, 1 October came very quickly. There was a lot of moving parts, and there were a lot of people, as Commissioner Gibson said, that said, oh, we got to do a memorial tomorrow. We got to, let's get going. And our staff said, time out. Uh, let's think about this. Let's talk to other places around the country. And I'm forever grateful because it helped so many of us heal through that process. It helped so many people uh, give different perspectives on things that uh, they may have seen or heard th throughout the process. And let's not forget the community who stepped up. And as great as the Golden Knights were, um, and it really is great that we can celebrate them again uh, today, but they really were a huge partner. But so many, com so many people that I know from around the country said, wow, I had no idea you had people that actually lived there and didn't live on the strip. And so uh, th that was a telling moment that we came together uh, for 15 states, for different people across the country. And so our staff was right to, and we didn't agree with them and we pushed back, they pushed back even harder, but uh, we listened. And um, because of it, I think today, uh, the committee is gonna have a, hard time deciding because each piece is so unique and each piece brings such detail uh, that it's great. I myself are, am thankful for my forever friends. I uh, became friends with about 6,000 of them uh, throughout the process and the reunions and coming back together and people across the, the country um, knowing that for Commissioner Gibson and I, we can say we've lived here our whole lives and really is telling on um, what we know about and we love about Nevada and Clark County in particular. So the designers, I wanna say thank you to you because you listened to the agony that people gave and said uh, during the process. You, and it is very, apparent that each piece you heard something that I've been hearing for six years and um, I thank you for that because you didn't rush in to try and just throw something at us because this is something that we want the rest of the world to know that impacted our community and it will always be a part of what our community is. And the committee members, man, you got a tough job ahead of you but I know that um, this is gonna be uh, probably the hardest part of what you've had to do uh, because now you got to try and represent everyone and I thank you for for st standing up stepping up and and going that process that process was not easy and um, not a lot of people wanted to be part of that process because it was hard for them so for me I am forever grateful for Clark County again coming together uh, doing what's right for our community and the and the community around us. Um, so I just really want to say thank you. And it's a little emotional for me. And Monday was probably harder on me than today. And each day gets a little bit easier for all of us. Uh, but it is a true testament of who our community is. And we can never replace that. So um, thank all of you for what you've done and, and what we'll continue to do, because this is only the first step, right? Is picking something and uh, then we gotta build it, then we gotta showcase it and keep it up and all of those things. So with that, um, just wanna invite uh, Mindy Myers up and she'll walk us through the process and we're excited to see what went into the detail. Thank you, commissioners. So we have a total of five presentations from five wonderful teams that have put together very thoughtful and meaningful submissions for this project. Um, that goes without being said, I believe. Each team will have up to 40 minutes. They do not have to use all of their time, but they may have up to 40 minutes. In between each presentation, we will have a five minute break to reset for the next presentation. There are several ways to be engaged in this meeting. You can be here in person. Um, we have our CCTV access channel four that you can watch it on. We have our website and also our Facebook page. So there's lots of ways to be engaged with this meeting tonight. I do wanna note that this is not a formal um, overall public meeting where, as you can see, there's no body sitting behind us. So you are here to present to the public. Um, there is no question and answer afterwards. 
we're not doing that through this meeting format. This is simply for presentations. So with that, I will introduce the first team to do their presentation, and that will be Olin plus Andy Scott. Test. Perfect. Great. Well, I want to start by saying thank you to all for being here today and um, for sharing your stories with us over the last six months. Uh, our presentation, our submission would be so much less without all of you. And we have truly been changed by this journey together. And we just really want to, to thank you all so much. It's my great honor and responsibility to be the one up here on behalf of our team to present. And it is great, while they, while they work out some of the technical pieces here, I will say we were really excited to be um, on the next day after the eve of the Golden Knights win. And 19,058 people were in attendance. So if you didn't notice that, it was kind of um, a pretty cool thing in advance of today as we remember the 58 lost. We're on a journey together, and some of you have been on this journey since October 1st, 2017. Others have joined more recently. Our hearts break for those that lost loved ones, for the survivors that are here to carry on, for those that have died since, for those struggling with mental issues, for those first responders, emergency responders who were affected that night. And we think of this journey as a procession towards hope, towards healing, and the commissioner said it really well as we move through this, um, this opportunity to really see this memorial as a way to bring hope, to bring healing to the communities. As we've talked to many of you over the last six months, we've noticed that no two narratives are the same. No two people are in the same place um, after this. And so as a foundational level, our design proposal is very simple to hold space for narratives, for experience, for the stories of the people that were there that night, for the stories of the families that lost loved ones, for those that were somehow touched by this tragedy. 22,000 people there that night, countless law enforcement, medical people that came. And so in one of the most intense urban experiences of the entire world, the Las Vegas Strip, we proposed something very simple, to hold the ground forever open as space, sacred ground in honor of those lost. Holding space for nature, holding space for art, and holding space for healing. We've arrived at this with deep listening. We said in January we didn't just want to um, do, uh, you know, check the boxes of engagement, but we really wanted to get to know some new friends. And so we feel like today what we're getting to present, our privilege to present, is really reflecting back what we've heard. And we're really proud um, of those friendships that have come. So we imagine in the future, when you arrive at the park, um, you will come into this space that is different and unique from anywhere else on the Las Vegas Strip. There were so many experiences that night. We've been inspired by the stories shared and the humility demonstrated. We've been inspired by the desire to promote self-worth and education. We feel that love can come out of tragedy. And as Angel Angela McElduhan shared with us, we really can feel sorrow and joy together. Alongside the events of that tragic night, we've looked to the Las Vegas context throughout our design considerations. Many of you might wonder why Las Vegas in the middle of, of the Mojave Desert. Uh, but those of you that live here or know Las Vegas know that this place is here because of the springs that were once here. Inhabitants made this their home, from indigenous peoples to settlers and cowboys that came through here, because Las Vegas represented hope in the middle of a long journey, getting to the oasis, getting to where water was, and knowing that you were gonna survive your journey, um, it was hard as it might be. So here, weary travelers stop for a drink of water, whether it was butterflies or birds or horses or people, in this place for renewal, and they found respite. The name Las Vegas meaning the meadows, and from this humble beginning, Las Vegas became a place of celebration, of arrival, um, as we know, and brought the Route 91 festival. So imagine this journey, what you're seeing in the animation here, a procession through the desert, through the native context of this, 
Weary and tired through pain and struggle that we've all experienced, and may you have experienced since October 1st, 2017, and coming to a place of tranquil, healing, sacred ground, unlike anywhere else in Las Vegas. So the plan for the park is inspired by this procession, processions towards healing that holds space forever along the Las Vegas Strip. The park frames open views of the sky while shielding out sight lines to other surroundings and keeping mid-level sight lines open and so people don't feel uh, confined or trapped. We've come up with ways that I'll describe in a minute to honor the 58. As you move through here, the name of each of the 58, as well as the name of other survivors and people that were involved um, or other people that have died since. So we invite you on this journey with us um, up as we move through it, and I'll describe in detail some of the other factors here. We've heard so many times the Route 91 community is really grounded in country music. And I mentioned this in January, I'm a huge country music fan, so the honor to be able to work on this has been significant. And one of the stories that came in our early listening to the community was one memory that so many survivors have of that night was the singing together of God Bless America. And so just minutes before the tragedy, when Big and Rich were on stage, with the simple sound of the strum of a guitar and voices united in unison singing God Bless America. So we thought, what would be a more appropriate way than to extract the sound wave of those voices united that night and actually start to think of that as a framework for our design. So we started to sketch some early ideas of how a sound wave might manifest across the site as part of this journey through the desert. Uh, could it start to demonstrate how um, there was a different people, a large crowd, 22,000 people singing together, and as you move through that experience, you could see that, the crescendos and the rise and fall of the narrative. So we took this sound wave and started to uh, play it, lay it into our, our site plan. And so as you move through this procession that we've described, this journey, you're literally moving along, the voices singing united together that night. And so here you can see in our site plan, like I said, our proposal at its foundational level is to build a park here. And we think this is great because a park Looks great on day one, but looks better every day after. And as the commissioners just said, this journey every day, we change, we get a little stronger, we get a little better. And that's what we believe a park in this location can be. So here you can see there's a main corridor to the park. I'll talk a little bit more about the heart of the park in a second. And we've made accommodations for everything from accessibility and accessible parking, shade, a small building to support resources. I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, as well as ways for visitors to have a quiet moment of tranquility as well or for small gatherings to occur. We were inspired by a lot of the creative expressions and we really thank the committee, the memorial committee for their um, efforts in reaching out and doing surveys with the community. Shauna Waltz shared with us this really amazing compass that she created where showing that the site is in the middle of the mountain ranges of the Mojave Desert here in Las Vegas. And this really resonated with us as we thought about this larger context and we thought about the park network of Clark County and the city of Las Vegas. And the park system is really amazing, but there really aren't a lot of parks along the Las Vegas Strip. The buildings are so intense. Um, there's, there's a lot of, you can be almost anywhere else in the world on the Las Vegas Strip, but you don't always necessarily feel like you're in Las Vegas. And so we wanted to honor uh, the context of Las Vegas and this, in this sacred ground. And when you look at the history of what I was describing earlier, you think about the springs that were here and settlers, cowboys, uh, First Nations that found their homes here in Las Vegas. You can see in this picture at the Stewart Ranch, you can see people stopping with their horses, watering their horses, this moment of hope, hope in the middle of um, exhaustion, in the middle of pain and suffering and coming to Las Vegas. And you can find springs across the, the Mojave Desert that, that really give this moment where there's water. Um, one of the survivors said, where there's water in the desert, there's hope. And so we think that this idea of the park bringing you through this procession towards an oasis um, starts to embody the hope that we hear when we talk with all of you. 
So at the heart of the park, coming to the springs, where the ground starts to break apart, this broken ground, this sacred ground, a gathering of humans and of sculpture that starts to create um, this moment where you know small events can take place. We have benches and other things to accommodate that, uh, but also on a, on a regular day, you can spend time here. You can move from the, the bustle of the Las Vegas Strip into this quiet moment of reflection and um, really healing through nature. Through the engagement process, which um, has been very moving and it takes a lot of energy, I know on all of our parts, um, to not tear up as we're presenting because when you start to listen to the narratives of people that were there that night or the family members that lost someone or law enforcement or emergency responders or medical staff, um, it's, it's really moving how this community has come together to support each other. Forever family comes to mind. I'm glad you're here. Really changing the way that this tragedy, taking it from something negative to something that has changed lives for the better in some ways because of the coming together. People have said we're there for the music. Please make sure that the music comes through. Um, everyone has stepped up. People literally, I think of Sue Ann, literally helping people get to the hospital that night with her truck, right? We've heard honor the 58 angels. Here in the room, we have family members of the 58. Um, we've been on the phone. We've been in working sessions with people. And lives that you know were put out way too soon on this planet in this event. We've heard a quiet place for reflection. I want to be able to go there. I want to be able to touch the ground. I want to feel this place. And I want to, to be able to reflect. We've also heard, I want to educate self-worth. So the Resiliency Center has done an incredible job thus far helping people connect to um, needs. Others in the region have helped with mental and behavioral awareness. This should also be a place where resources can be available to community members and make it last. I'm sure everyone in this room that has been following this process, those that are listening at home online or through Facebook, you've put in the effort to get to this point today. We want something that's not just gonna be here in five years, but it's gonna be here in 50 years, in 100 years. When children go on a field trip in the future, they will come to this site and they will understand and they will be lifted up by hope and by knowing that they have value and that they don't need to act out in violence. We've been able to talk with a lot of you, sometimes in person, sometimes on screen. We've done over 40 one-on-one -on -one listening sessions with survivors, with family members, with law enforcement. Um, we've had 20 individuals that gave us detailed feedback they would preferred uh, to write. Uh, Bill, you're seeing on screen, uh, we asked if we could use his picture. Um, he was here at the Route 91 Festival to celebrate his 71st birthday with a group of friends, right? And what a life-changing moment for him uh, to experience this, and he's been so generous with his time, as have others. Uh, it's just one person to, to reference here. Um, we've been able to do some in-person work sessions with groups. We've been at the Healing Garden working, um, being able to be up there for a couple of different days, um, coordinating. We've also um, had a visual survey that a lot of you did uh, to be able to say what resonated with you. Um, these moments have really touched us and have really shown us the strength of this community. The Vegas Strong community is alive and well and going strong. We've heard things like, you know, we're not on the alone, we're on the same journey but different paths. We've heard th some families say, you know, our response to this tragedy is to respond with joy. Joy and love and positivity should overshadow. We've heard nature can hate pe help people feel. Um, the healing will never be complete until there is a memorial. We've heard that we need to acknowledge the strength of collaboration of the different departments, the police, the fire, concert attendees. Um, there will be light at the end of this tunnel. And um, the, I'm so happy you're here at the start of events, or I'm so glad you're here, being something that's so meaningful. We've also seen in the creative expression so many ingredients that have become foundational to our strategy. So in the Freedom Plaza uh, that Nancy submitted, the idea that there would be the center moment of hope and light. Um, we've seen in Sue's submission of the guitar how we might use music notes, which you'll, I'll talk about in a second, to honor the 58. Um, we've seen this idea of the guitar, the procession, the movement uh, in nature coming through. And we've also heard a lot about honoring and making space for children who lost parents. 
So 55 children lost their parents the night of October 1st. And how do we make a space in this memorial that feels for them? We've heard parents say, I still don't know how to talk up to my children about this. Can we make a space of sculpture that is just for kids? And Andy will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, but really acknowledging that there are children whose lives were forever altered that night. In the garden, we've been able to talk about how the healing garden and the work that's happening there um, might be able to uh, connect to the memorial in the future. And I do want to take a moment to give a really great shout out to um, a lot of our team members that are able to join us today. Hanukkah Scott, a curator and uh, worker with uh, Andy as a director of their studio. Chit Lu, our managing associate. Jana Karaman, our senior landscape architect. And Madison Murray, our landscape architect on the team. Because this team has really gotten to know people and we, we really love this community being out there. This is Joanna and I. Um, what we've learned is that there are opportunities to connect to what's already happening. So we realize that we're joining this journey at this point, but we want to learn from those that have already been on this. So out at the garden, we talked about ideas about taking the acorns from the central tree to be able to germinate trees for the future memorial park, creating this connection between them. We also talked about the 5K that's run annually, and perhaps that can be park to memorial 5K in the future that really is starting line at one, finishing line at the other, that these pieces are part of the healing process together and that they both will continue to thrive into the future. At the Simi Valley um, Roundup Festival, Madison and I got to meet with a lot of people who got in some country line dancing um, out there and really being able to hear from communities what it means to be able to come together um, as the Route 91 family. Um, and also what it means, we heard, had heard a lot about the local um, native environment of Las Vegas. And so in terms of the Mojave Desert, we've been talking a lot about how do we respect and how do we um, talk about the different uh, environmental habitats that exist and how do we ensure that the place here has a lot of um, native species that will thrive in this place and for generations to come. And how does that relate to creating year-round shade? Anybody that's been outside today knows that we need year-round shade in this place. So we've done a lot of detailed study on how the park can create welcoming spaces throughout the year to make sure that this is habitable and comfortable. And we've also done a lot of thought thinking about the buffer edges. How does this habitat for the sculptures start to frame views? And how does it honor the larger Mojave Desert uh, landscapes that we see, like in the foothills and the canyons? So with a gentle rise in the topography, which some of you might have seen in our model, um, and using trees, we are able to shield some of the surrounding views while also not making a place that feels scary or, or, or claustrophobic. We heard from a lot of people. They didn't want to feel trapped in this space. This desert uh, buffer comes to life, as you can see here in different parts of the year with different species that bloom um, and really help to create this experience of moving towards the spring, moving towards the center moment of hope where you start to see life springing out of the pavement. Um, there is, there's, uh, we were obviously asked to not use water, but how do we evoke this feeling of water in the desert without having a site that's gonna take a lot of water? So we've been very climate resilient, drought tolerant. We're looking to the future. How does this thing adapt to our current climate conditions and the current uh, re water requirements that Las Vegas is? So we are working very hard to make sure that this landscape um, really honors the, the desert and also becomes a place that you can um, imagine the presence of water here uh, in the center where this moment comes for gathering. Throughout the seasons, we also want the plant species of the gardens and the park to really um, blossom with flowers, right? The desert after a rainstorm is one of the most beautiful sights in the world. And a lot of people around the world don't know that, but if you live here, you know the desert can be gorgeous. So we have species, we've worked to stay in the uh, yellow, purple, orange color span. We know that the wristbands that night were purple and orange. And so those of you that know, will know when you go there and you see these blossoms in purple and orange, what it means. But it will be of the desert landscape in a beautiful, subtle way. 
And last but certainly not least here is the idea of the sensory experience. So we want the smells, the sounds, to create this moment of tranquility along the Las Vegas Strip. We've worked with our acoustics team to really create a transition from what the typical Las Vegas Strip is to come into an environment that feels different, that feels sacred, that feels special. I'm now going to turn it over to Andy Scott, who's going to talk specifically about the sculptures. Oops, sorry the sculptures across the park. Thanks very much, Jessica. Can you hear me okay? I've been told uh, before I started I had to speak nice and slowly, otherwise I'd baffle you all my Scottish accent. So I'll, I'll go as slowly as I can. And unlike Jessica, who's uh, very capable of speaking free-flowing, I'm going to read from a script, so I hope you'll forgive me. I, I usually let my hands do my talking with a five-pound hammer, so uh, bear with me. Uh, thanks for listening in advance. Um, I'm Andy Scott, and along with my wife, Hanika, we are the sculpture members of the team, and I'd like to tell you about, about our role in the memorial. We create all kinds of large-scale public sculpture, and the horse is a subject I love working with, as you can see in this image. Our sculpture is well known for the Kelpies, two 100-foot-high steel horses' heads in my native country of Scotland. This installation celebrates the legacy of the native Clydesdale draft horses and the role they played in Scotland's agriculture and industry. The Kelpie sculptures have become a national landmark for Scotland, and in fact for the whole of Britain. Even as their creators, we are often amazed how they manifest themselves in the landscape, rain or shine, day or night, and it rains a lot in Scotland. It was their broad appeal, their universal heartwarming response they received, as well as the deep connections humans have with horses that made us first consider horses as a suitable subject for the memorial. It was a love of country music that brought people together that fateful evening. It struck us that horses are a recurring element in country music and would add to the musically inspired elements of our proposal. Horses are evocative of the spirit of the American West. They're a huge part of the culture of America, and of course, they've been the subject of countless country songs. We believe equine sculptures will have a calming and serene presence within the context of the project. They'll be a thought-provoking and uplifting symbol, a potent subject which would be emotionally powerful and connect with people, offering an opportunity for interpretation and narrative. Horses would be a subject which would create healing and comforting ambience for survivors, families, and general public visitors to the memorial. We're all familiar with the amazing healing qualities of horses, and they're now regularly engaged around the world as therapy animals, including right here in Las Vegas, as you can see in these images from Terry Keener and Laura Higgins at the Stable Arena. We've witnessed horses' therapeutic abilities firsthand, as Hanukkah and I sponsor horses with riding for the disabled back in Scotland, and it really is quite a profound effect that these mag magnificent animals can have for those in need. They seem to know when someone's in need of help, and rather than propose a traditional somber memorial statue for the project, we wanted to create something which somehow evoked that healing quality, that pacifying, deep, almost spiritual essence that horses have. When we visited the memorial location in Las Vegas back in January and walked onto the site, I immediately thought of some kind of procession, a procession of remembrance. An artwork that you would not just stand there as a passive statue and make you feel sad or that you could lay flowers at, but a continuous artwork you would walk among or through. It would be an artwork which would accompany you on a journey of remembrance and reflection that would be a magical yet poignant emotional experience in the midst of the busy everyday activity of Las Vegas. Sure, you'll be able to lay flowers or pay your respects as with any commemorative sculpture, but we wanted to create something that would console and at the same time offer emotional uplift. A sculpture installation you would feel as much as you would see. We propose that the horses will be about three times life size. We wanted to create something that would not be lost among the massive architecture of the city. Artworks that would, that would reflect the almost overpowering scale of the loss, that would make us feel small and yet comforted at the same time, the way a child might see things. Most importantly, we wanted to create an artwork that, through its sheer scale, would reflect the momentous heroism of responders and the brave civilians on the night. And this is what we came up with. As you walk along East Reno Avenue, you'll encounter the first of our horses. She'll be standing at the entrance to our memorial, and you'll see her leaning out from the edge of the site, inviting you in, waiting for you, saying hello. She'll be standing in contrast to the dynamic excitement of downtown Las Vegas, serenely beautiful in her deep patinated bronze hues against the foliage of her park landscape. Behind her, the next horse, as you can see, is turned towards you, asking you to join the procession of giants through their habitat towards the gathering space. Each horse leads one to the next, some with heads held low to engage directly with you, to look you in the eyes as if to say, it's okay, we know. 
The horses have no riders. Some are bareback, some will have only blankets, some are, one or two will have empty saddles. The riders have gone. The intended poignancy of this is, we hope, instantly recognizable. You'll wander among them, among the shady foliage, maybe taking rest in one of the alcove areas. You'll walk among the names of those we lost and feel calm and comforted by your towering equine companions. They'll lead you to the central spings, the gathering space, where our idea is that you can sit among a circle of horses in a natural clearing in the trees, an oasis reminiscent of the very beginnings of the city of Las Vegas. And along the way, you'll encounter the foals. We heard many youngsters lost a parent that night and we wanted to create something in the memorial that would be specifically for children. Children are often overlooked in the grown-up world of tragedy and grief, so we have two foal sculptures at rest in a shady alcove area. Our hope is that they will somehow offer solace for the younger visitors, visitors who lost parents, aunts or uncles in the tragedy. We've heard that people struggle to find the words to explain to children what happened, so perhaps these sculptures will be a conduit to understanding. They'll be cast in bronze, so totally durable and at ground level, so if kids want to give them a hug, then that's just fine. In addition to the two foals, there will be 15 horses in total, rep representing one each for each of the states the victims came from and from Canada. The horses will be cast in bronze. They will be sculpted in clay by hand, first by me and my assistants at our studio in Los Angeles. Then they will be cast by our foundry partners and patinated in a beautiful deep coppery green hue, which will work perfectly in the verdant landscape setting of the memorial site. On the left, you can see the famous horses of St. Mark's in Venice. These are to show you that bronze sculpture lasts a very, very long time. They reckon the horses of St. Mark's date as far back as the second century and were originally in ancient Constantinople. So bronze is an ageless material in many ways and carries the artistic gravitas that is befitting a memorial sculpture installation. The sculptures will require next to no maintenance other than an occasional clean or wax. And of course, we will supply full maintenance and material schedules on completion of the project. We want you to be involved in the sculpture's creation. Our idea is that those of you who wish to will be able to imprint a memory onto the sculptures. This might be some kind of memento, symbol, or message which represents your loved ones lost in the tragedy. The sketch on the left shows that this might be on the horse blankets which some of the horses will wear. Perhaps this could be linked to the patterns of the quilts we saw at the Resiliency Centre. It's open for discussion and we look forward to working that detail out with you. Those of you who are able will be welcome to our early studio to view the original sculptures during the creation and to personally emboss, imprint or mark the soft clay of the artworks and we will work with those of you who can't make it to the studio to figure out a way to do so. This is a technique we employed once before in our infant's memorial in Edinburgh, Scotland, where forget-me-not flowers are embossed onto the surface of that sculpture, as you can see in that little close-up detail. Here's a very short film of me in action, <laughs> working on a small maquette study I've made of one of the horses on the mezzanine of my LA studio. It shows me modeling uh, the clay, and I'm working on the pose that I might use for one of the memorial sculptures. I'm almost in the finishing touches here, and this clay is yet to be cast. It lets you see and imagine how we can make those imprints I mentioned into the soft clay. The clay models for the sculptures will be considerably larger than this. Those surface imprints would then be cast in bronze and captured forever as an intrinsic personal part of the sculptures. We would record the sculptures creation every step of the way and keep you updated and progress throughout as they go from the soft clay modeling stage through the enlarging and mold making process to the final bronze pour and casting, patination and assembly into the permanent timeless bronze. I should also add that in Edinburgh for the Infants Memorial, a multiple edition of the small scale bronzes of that sculpture was specifically cast and made available to bereaved parents and families. And this is also a possibility we'd wish to explore for the memorial horses. Returning to the full scale proposal for the memorial, in this visualization, you can see the procession entering the gathering space. The horses will be arranged and posed to create a sense, a sense of tranquil grandeur, offering a magical realm to pause and reflect. They'll stand in harmony with the landscaping, benches and planting. The gathering space can also be reached from the second entrance at the small car park on Giles Avenue. From Giles, another pair of horses welcome you and lead you into the springs. You see from these images how much emphasis we place on a sense of our inter interaction with the sculptures, creating, as I said at the beginning, artworks with a presence that you can feel as much as you can see. It's a proud, profound honor for us to present these gentle giants within their beautiful setting. Uh, we look forward to working with you to bring these serene equine monuments to fruition to honor those lost and those who served and acted with such bravery. Thank you for putting up with my Scottish accent and thank you very much for listening. And I'll give you back to Jessica and she'll tell you about the other details of our proposal. Thank you. 
So these horses move through a habitat that we have worked really hard to make sure is enduring and easy to maintain and also very constructible. One of the things that we want to make sure is that through the landscape, people can be educated about what happened that night. And so one of the things we've worked with in the paving is to be able to honor those lives lost and as well as other things. So this is where phrases or sayings, um, we're glad you're here, or other poems or things that are lyrics that are meaningful could start to be embedded also into the pavement. Um, we talked to, to Robin Wolf. She gave us the permission to use Bill's name here as an example on the right. Um, and really being able to, as you move through this procession, honor the 58. We also have the opportunity for others that are interested and want their name to appear in the memorial to have their memorials pr printed onto the sound wave at, as we move towards the edges to recognize that this tragedy has affected so many lives. Um, We've thought a lot about accessibility. We know some people that will be visiting the site will need accessible routes, accessible parking. And this is something that means so much to our office. We focus a lot of our time and research energy into um, accessibility for all populations. So in our proposal to the county, we've included um, features for not only accessible walkways and pathways, but also for uh, neurodivergent, deaf, um, or heart, uh, people with uh, limited eyesight to be able to experience this memorial as well. We've provided parking on the far south end of the site that would be accessible parking, but also spaces that people that were affected by the tragedy could reserve a spot. So if you wanted to go visit the site on the birthday of your loved one, you could also you could park here, not have any hassle, and be able to visit the site. Um, we've also made sure that the site is very accessible from local public transit and other parking um, to make sure that this site is a place that people can um, enjoy and be. Lighting is such a crucial part of the Las Vegas landscape. And so when we thought about this memorial, we wanted something that would feel different, that would feel unique and special along the Las Vegas Strip. And so we've worked very hard to create a layered, layered lighting that will make this pace feel very safe in the evenings. This is a park, so it can be open more frequently than a building could be open, for example. It's easier to staff, but we want to make sure it's safe. So we've thought a lot in our proposal about security. Um, we've, we're evoking the idea of fireflies um, in the landscape, as well as lights above that will give this feeling of a starry night, um, as well as these gentle washes that we've worked uh, to light the sculptures, um, and this sort of feeling of the light dancing on the pavement as you're moving along the procession. The site is furnished with robust, very durable wood furnishings um, that again evoke the native ecology of the Mojave Desert. So we have these small alcoves off of that main procession. We know that some people need a minute to be able to step off and reflect, to be able to sit quietly. And so these smaller, we call these the living rooms, moments to step off, allow this moment of reflection. In these spaces, we know that people will, will have QR codes. We'll be able to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and we know people will want to leave something. And we spend a lot of time thinking about mementos on the site. We want to leave things that are going to make it better every day, not something that's going to become a maintenance challenge that's not going to be well handled. So we've come up with the idea of these wild, compostable wildflower notes that people can bring. You can write a message, leave in the park, and every day when someone leaves a memento, the park only gets better. We only add to the beauty of the park with every memento that is left here. You can write, as we wrote on this one, hope blooms in memory of. And you can write a message um, here and leave it uh, as, as behind. We've also talked with a lot of you about education in the landscape, being able to um, post stories of loved ones or families in a digital way that people could read in the landscape, and also the need to update that. We know that a lot of technology and a lot of other things in memorials gets outdated a year after it's installed. We, we didn't want that for this memorial. We want this to get better every day after it is. So we've come up with a digital interface idea that then can allow people with their phone to be able to read more, and that material can be updated very easily and very cost effectively. Um, and also from around the world. We know that not everybody can be in this room today. We know there are survivors across the world, um, and so they can also then interact with this digitally. We've also heard the need for a place for resources. So if you come to the park, you are moved or changed by this experience, or you need mental support, or you need other uh, services, or you need to learn more, we wanted to make sure there's a resource hub on the, on the, on the site. 
So we have a small pavilion. It takes a, it's a back step to the, uh, a back, takes a little bit of a back seat to the horses and the habitat of the horses because it's this subtle way that we can offer resources, restrooms, other needed amenities to make the park function. And we've thought a lot about how the elements of this can honor different special numbers in the system. One of the things that we've thought a lot about is how we can work with the community to start to think about what signage or other elements um, could be part of this. And this is up for continued conversation. We're not the team that's showing you something today and you have to pick that and nothing will change and you're gonna show up in seven years and that's what it's gonna be. We wanna work with you on some of these things. One idea we've been studying a lot is how the sun moves and how the slats of the pavilion roof might dance with the light through the day. We've, we've started to take the notes of God Bless America and use 58 points of light coming through those slats to be able to cast a shadow on the ground and be able to have that conversation, another way of honoring uh, those lost. I don't want to miss the fact that we wanna get this built and we want it to be maintained. So our proposal to the county includes the idea of an education and maintenance conservancy endowment, and we have laid out ideas for how funding for long-term maintenance and support of this might be accomplished. We know this is a big undertaking. We know there's still fundraising to do. We know there's still uh, work to be done. Um, but we think this is really important, that people can be um, curators for this and really ensure that this is going to be maintained um, long, long into the future, after most of us in this room may even be, be gone. We also imagine that that conservancy can manage the digital aspect of this to ensure that that's kept up to date. Many of you might be familiar with things like Friends of the High Line or the Central Park Conservancy or the Yosemite Conservancy. We imagine that that's the kind of model that this park needs to be really successful into the future and not burden um, other entities or other individuals or rely only on volunteers to make this happen. We have put together a global team of world-class leaders. Um, Olin is a landscape architecture firm. We've been around for about 45 years. I'm the partner in charge of our Los Angeles studio. We have a team of about 100 designers uh, around the country. We have done memorials on the National Mall um, and in other places all around the world. We would be so honored to work with this. Andy and Hanukkah, who you met a minute ago, um, international sculptor of great renown. We're so lucky to be coordinating and collaborating. We also have Antonio Acoustics. We think acoustics are critical for this site. HLB Lighting has helped us think very thoughtfully about that. Geosyntec doing restoration ecology. We want to get those, the plants right, the habitat for the horses. We want to get that perfect. Thornton Tomasetti providing structural. C GCW, local civil engineer here, knows Las Vegas, like the back of their hand, and how to get projects done. Interface for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Darm Consulting for cost, but also risk analysis through rock solid project solutions who can help get this project really built and done. We believe that it will be incredibly wonderful to open this park on the 10 year remembrance of the event. That is a robust and ambitious goal but one of the ways that we have worked together on our team is we have eked out a schedule that makes that possible with this park, and we would be really excited to be standing there with you. In a very detailed schedule that we gave the county, this is a summary, we worked through every month between now and 2027 to think through that. We also wanted to think we're not just gonna disappear for four years and show back up and here it's done, so we've tried to think of how we can engage from day one. And one of the ways, as Andy was describing, is we actually want to invite people to the Los Angeles studio to participate in the creation of the sculpture for the park. Um, and through a lot of other engagement things to get this done, but to get it done together. We know that the event of that night will never, um, will never go away in the minds of many people here. And we, our heart, has broken in this process, as was said in January, we've truly been changed. And we want to know that we really do this for all of you. We see this as, as your proposal, your project, and the 58 that were lost that night. I wanted to quote the, the song Country Love here, yet somehow each day we choose to move on and prove to ourselves we are still country strong. As we honor the angels that were made that night and the many who helped in the midst of the fight. 
We look forward to the opportunity to collaborate and to make this memorial a reality for the Route 91 community, Las Vegas, Clark County, and the world. And we know that we can build this memorial park together. We invite you to come as you are, hold space for narrative. You can walk the journey as a community or you can walk in silence alone. Come and experience the park. You can find the horse that speaks to you. Celebrate joy even in the midst of sorrow. We imagine 22,000 voices singing together, God bless America. We imagine a future and when you'll hear the strum of a guitar played here, maybe. We grieve those that were lost. We want to educate for the future and build self-worth in our youth so that they never feel the need to act out in violence. We invite you to come and to tell your story and to look to the sky as the sun shines on the meadows of Las Vegas as it has for thousands of years and witness the healing power of art and nature to change lives. The spirit of this memorial will live on and to whatever extent our project can serve the grieving families and those survivors, we will be so honored to do so. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce the next design team, and that will be JCJ Architecture. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Derek Sola, design principal, JCJ Architecture. I am honored here today to be with Cynthia Lee from Think Design, as well as Andrew Kraft from, uh, from Lifescapes. It's hard to believe that less than 24 hours ago, we were witnessing our beloved Vegas Golden Knights take on and win the Stanley Cup championship. It's been a, a long journey, um, but they've really inspired hope and have galvanized this community. Similarly, I think this memorial will do the same. I think it has an opportunity to bring us together and galvanize as one. I wanna thank the Clark County Commission as well as the One October Memorial Committee for having the dedication, the persistence, and the passion for this project. In addition, I want to thank all the brave men and women who attended our listening sessions and really shared with us their experiences and their, their visions and their understandings and wants and desires for the memorial. Uh, I know it wasn't an easy task, but we thank you greatly for that. We developed a name for the memorial called the Forever One Memorial. It's really based on the notion of an infinity shape, as you can see in the center of the graphic. It's this idea of infinite memory and eternal love for those that were lost. In addition, it has resonance with the Forever Family of the Route 91 Harvest Festival, as well as uh, the idea of, of being living on forever. Um, one, being close to the, the number of, of, uh, of October 1. I'm so glad you're here is a phrase that we heard many times throughout our listening sessions. It acknowledges the, the greeting of each other that they survived this horrific event and that they're here to celebrate together and be together at this moment. We began this journey by really defining the visions and the goals for this project. The primary goals being a space that honors the 58 as well as a place for the families and the survivors to come together and heal. Also a place to acknowledge the emergency responders who rushed in that day to save so many lives. And also a place to, uh, to allow for grieving, for healing, and for, for, for comfort. We couldn't have done this journey without a great team behind us that has uh, amazing local experience as well as extensive international expertise. We've added a, a new team member to uh, our project list here, and that's partnering with Tim Bavington, who's a local artist who will be generating a one-of-a-kind uh, sculptural piece that is the backdrop to our memorial design. The process really began with a, a critical moment where we engaged in seven different listening sessions with the community. This entailed family members, concert goers, emergency responders, artists, 
and the Vegas Strong community itself. It was a chance for us to really hear the needs and the wants and desires of the memorial, and it really began to shape this design. So the design is really born out of the comments that were provided to us, and we thank you for that. We want to acknowledge your willingness to have these conversations with us as acts of generosity and sincerity. To be honest, this project has brought up difficult issues. And what we could hear was that one October was the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Yet somehow it can feel forgotten with each mass shooting, but not its ripple effects. And I think I can speak for our entire team when I say that one October has affected all of us. In our listening sessions, you asked, will there be an education component? What are people going to learn? And underneath that question might be, what is the meaning of all this? What are people going to come away with after visiting the memorial? Over and over, you told us about the acts of kindness and of humanity you've borne witness to since the shooting. And we've tried to instill that spirit into the memorial design itself. We were inspired by several of the creative submissions, one in particular being the paintings of Jason Swope, number 65. We feel that his paintings really captured the spirit of the aftermath that occurred after October 1. Um, we were really inspired by the idea of the can candlelight vigils that occurred throughout the city immediately after the shooting. In addition, we were inspired by submission number 97 with these rays of light extending into the heavens and connecting with the skies above. We, this is a series of uh, progressive diagrams that really illustrate our approach to the site and how we evolved the, the shape of the infinity uh, on the site itself. We looked at the site, which is 610 feet in length. If you began at one end and walked to the other, you're essentially walking a path and you have to turn around and retrace your steps through that path. We began to think about it as a loop where the pathway could be a, a journey, a narrative journey that really tells the story of the events of that day. Uh, in addition, we began to kind of loop it under and over itself to create a point of inflection to tell the story of, of what happens when that first shot rang out, where the story really changed. So we dedicated two areas, one area to the south that's dedicated to the 58, the area to the north is dedicated to the, the community as a whole. Uh, the, the area to the south is very protected and isolated, so we kind of gave it a smaller shape relative to the area to the north, which is dedicated to the community, which is more open and accessible. The imprint of the memorial is very evident uh, from above. We have over 18 million people flying into Las Vegas annually. So this shape will be highly visible and be seen from above. Uh, a defining feature will be the lighting of the memorial. Uh, the lighting will follow the shape of the infinity and will really become a, a beacon and, and uh, an identifiable imprint into the urban landscape. The journey begins well before you reach the site. A tower of light is 58 feet tall. It really becomes a beacon that's highly visible from the South Strip. As people approach the site, we feel that they'll be coming down Reno Avenue and enter from the north and circulate through the south. It'll be uh, an identifiable front entry into the, uh, into the memorial, one where the journey really begins um, at number one. So as guests enter into the memorial, they begin to experience the story, the journey. They'll descend down a, a very gentle sloping ramp that then takes you into an area that we call the Remembrance Ring, which is where the 58 are honored, and then pulls you back up through the Tower of Light and onto the community plaza. These are the moments, of, uh, the moments within the, the memorial design, the first one being the rammed earth wall. This wall is meant to screen Mandalay Bay and really has an important significance that we'll touch here in a moment. The 58 uh, candles are identified below that. This is where there's um, essentially 58 totem structures that will be illuminated during the day and will uh, refract light during the, during, illuminated at night and refract light during the day. There's also an adjacent uh, angel wall that 
is really uh, composed of this foreground background with the 58 candles. Below the Tower of Light is the surround. It's a chamber of 22,000 points of light, uh, evoking the idea of being at a concert. The Tower of Light is a, a glass installation, a colored plate glass that really um, uh, comes off of the amphitheater and begins to spiral up this tower, this 58-foot tower. It's really connecting the north and south sides of the site and really becomes a beacon for all to see. And lastly, the community plaza being more open to Guile Street. Uh, it's very accessible from the entry and becomes a destination for the community as a whole. So the upper left image is really the, the, the first introduction uh, of the memorial as you come off of East Reno. We're bringing the materials out to the corners so that you're really introduced right away to uh, the, the moments that you'll see throughout the journey. So the colored plate glass, the Ranverth walls are really a, a visual feature uh, at the corner. As you begin to enter into the site, you see majestically the Ranverth walls rising out of the desert floor. You'll see a series of flags, the American flag, Canadian flag, state of Nevada, and then the Route 91 flag. Then you begin to the journey of descending down the ramp of where a number of, of quotes will begin to address uh, the guest and begin to tell, tell out the narrative of the, uh, the journey. What's very important for us is the soil is sacred. This is where bullets penetrated the earth it's where lives were lost. It's where blood was shed. The site journey is really about excavating into the earth. The area dedicated to the 58 is sunken five feet below the street elevation. It's done purposely to really create an insulated and isolated uh, area that um, it, the sounds of the cars on Guile Street are muffled. But we're taking that soil that's excavated and we're putting into the rammed earth walls. Rammed earth walls are essentially compressed earth so the sacred soil then becomes the walls. You can touch and feel the walls. It leads you through your journey, and it also shields your views to other surrounding towers. As you begin to descend down this ramp, this, the narrative begins to unfold. There's places to take rest and refuge from the sun. It's really a, a memorial that's born out of the desert, so you're seeing color tones that are evocative of, of the desert. The plate glass is, is earthen in tone at the base, and then as it begins to spiral up the tower, begins to take on the colors of the skies above. At night, it'll glow so that it's highly visible along the southern strip. Below the Tower of Light is the surround. This is a, an, an immersive experience that really conveys this idea of 22,000 points of light as if you're in a concert environment, such as being at the Route 91 uh, Music Festival, when you're surrounded by similar people who are there to celebrate country music, and all the lights on their cell phones are lit up. It's about becoming one with the community, becoming one with the concert goers. And in this space, which is circular in shape, there'll be uh, interactive screens that as you get closer to the screens, the pixels of light actually become photos from concert goers that are uploaded to a central network. This juxtaposition of pixel of light becoming a photo then is quite interactive and immersive as you begin to circulate around this central area. Rising out of the surround, you ramp up to a minus five feet elevation. Uh, you're addressed then with the remembrance ring. This is where the 58 candles resides, as well as an adjacent tiered landscape area for seating and the angel wall, which is number two in this plan. Here, 58 candles, which are illuminated at the tops, will glow at night. And during the day, they will refract light with beautiful color and white light. They're meant to be able to circulate through the space. There's interlocking rings on each candle that unites each ring or each candle to each other. There are 58 candles. They're each space 58 inches on center and they're centered within a 58-foot diameter circle. This is really the power of the 58. It plays out throughout the entire narrative and journey of the story. The Tower of Light is 58 feet tall. We use that as symbols to honor and respect the 58. 
the candles are triangular in shape, so they have three sides. One side will have the name of the victim, the other side will have a photo of the victim with a QR code, the third side will be a brief description of the individual. During the day, it's created out of prismatic glass, so as light hits the prism, it'll essentially project onto the paving below. And at night, it'll, be, it'll have this beautiful warm glow. There's internal LED lights within each candle so that the lighting can be controlled. On the birthday of a victim, it can, grow a different, it can glow a different colored light than the rest of the field of candles. Or it could be programmed that it can truly look as if it is a candle burning in the, in the horizon. The paving at the uh, remembrance ring is very light in color, so it can receive the, the refracted light during the day. To the left is a carved out area within the rammed earth walls. We call this the angel wall. It's essentially a shaded cloister area that will provide refuge during the day from the, the hot, intense sun. The bases of the candles are perforated metal, so the perforations are more intense at the base as they begin to kind of fade out towards the zone of information on the candles. There's seating surrounding the, the entire um, remembrance ring for those who want to sit and contemplate. There's also landscaped area where you can really view the candles in relation to the angel wall beyond. The angel wall is a series of words that are relation, relational in nature to, to the victims and how they related to others. So they were father, they were mother, they were wife, they were a son, they were a daughter, but most importantly, they are now angels to all of us. Exiting the remembrance ring, you take another subtle ramp up to the Tower of Light. The path is always changing. You're never circulating back along a path that you have just traveled. And the story is continuous, as Cynthia will describe here momentarily. As you approach the Tower of Light, you have essentially two strings of, of uh, colored plate glass that begins to rise up overhead and really connects to the heavens. During our listening sessions, we heard that during the first remembrance, it was a very overcast day. And when Mayor Goodman approached the podium, the skies opened up and a ray of light came down and shined on her. This is our moment where you connect one with the heavens. Where the surround below this is about becoming the many, this is the moment of becoming one. Becoming one with the sky, becoming one with the 58, really completing the journey. The community plaza is a, an open plaza that is really meant to be explored. There are a number of, of arcs that, that cut through the plaza that uh, essentially represent different um, communities and the, the overlapping stories that we heard from all of our listening sessions. There are a number of planters that have uh, trees that will allow for tree canopies to provide shade for the, for the users, as well as an open area, number four, for um, listening to music or having performances or where the community can gather. Just adjacent to that is a, an amphitheater that rises up out of the, the plaza floor, which is um, with a backdrop of the Tim Bavington sculpture behind it. Tim is a local artist. He's most known for his pipe dreams over at Symphony Park. Um, we're working with him to really develop the, uh, the expression of this glass installation. What he does is he interprets a country song and then de deconstructs it, decomposes it into a series of colors and bands and plates that begins to give uh, cadence to the song itself in an ab abstracted matter. Uh, we have a number of songs in mind, but we would like to work with the committee as well as the community to really determine what the best song would be uh, best represented on the site. You can see here the backdrop of his glass plates, which is facing west, so during the evening sun, beautiful light will come through this uh, installation. It'll be shedding light onto the, those that are gathered at the amphitheater. This is really a place that is meant to be a gathering place to heal, to share stories, to even view the stories uh, that are playing out in the arcs. Each arc has a very specific um, group associated with it, whether it's family members, concert goers, emergency responders, or the community itself. 
The walls of the planters are utilized for lyrics and for quotes. And altogether, it becomes uh, a beautiful experience of meandering through this space. For the landscape, we wanted to make sure that we're not creating a fantasy environment here. We don't want to greenwash the natural scenery and create something that it's not, something that's trying to be somewhere else, something else. For, for the Forever One Memorial, we're creating a landscape that feels that it's of the land here. It's of Las Vegas, it's of the Mojave Desert. This, this authenticity, we really feel like is a, honors the place that we're in, Las Vegas Valley. It honors those that were involved in the event and it also looks to the future and that we're not creating a landscape that is environmentally unsustainable. Now, our first reflection in doing this is we, you look out at what you see out in the undeveloped areas of the city. You see sand, rock, gravel. That's what you see and this picture very much explains how you see the sand turning into gravel going into craggy rocks, you know, and in formations that echo the upheaval, you know, of eons ago. So when, what we're creating, we're creating this, the first thing we're doing is laying a rock mulch across the entire site that reflects this. We start from a small, ready colored sand decomposed granite that have, grows into gravel, then grows larger into crushed rocks and granites as it moves into the center of the site. For the paving, we wanted to echo the colors of the, the valley and connect with the rammed earth walls with these reddish tones. And we start with stone pavers that are leading you in, in a linear pattern and a rectilinear form to reflect the normalcy before the event. As we move down through and up, these stones begin to fragment and are only, only um, contained by the concentric rings that radiate out from the uh, the ring of remembrance and the candles, which are then sitting on top, as Derek said, of a glistening white exposed, exposed aggregate paving that will catch the refracted light and the shadows above or from above. And then across the angel wall, we're showing a dark gray, smooth pebble exposed aggregate paving that really give a cooling retreat for those that want to sit back and take in what they're seeing. And then as we move on to the community, up to the community area, the stone gives way to this quilt of different panels of exposed aggregate. There goes from reds to golds to pick up the colors of the valley. They're all knitted together with the community bands running through it that really creates an overall feeling of one. The planting follows on this thinking where it's very much open at the edges and as we grow, go in, we start getting tufts of, of ground cover, tufts of the smaller shrubs that then continue on to become a little bit larger, a little more dense, bringing in cacti and succulents that populate and bring in color. Then as we get to the middle, much like in the picture you see on the right at the Las Vegas Springs Preserve, we bring it a much more of a lush desert scene that we really feel like makes it feel like the land is healing itself. The trees really what, what knits this together and creates districts to this park. We use the processional trees to lead you in along the ramp coming in, whereas dense trees along the left side of the graphic to block views of the surrounding areas and the towers. The bottom side of the graphic is facing the Catholic Church across the street, and we want to have more openness over there. We have much more dappled trees that you can, canopy trees that you can see under, that then flow into the community area where we're doing a mixture of, of shade trees, uh, you know, wonderful desert trees and flowering trees. So really this becomes a, a place that is intimate and encourages you to stay, reflect, and interact all through the seasons.
So the path through the memorial is its song. And our songwriting process began with the conversations that we had with community members. What we heard was, first and foremost, the memorial is a place to give permanence and visibility to the 58 angels, a place to celebrate their memory, where their stories can be held and not be forgotten. Second, given its location on the Strip, an international destination, its role as a public space in the city of Las Vegas, and its important story, the memorial should be a place where we offer opportunities for learning and gathering, as well as for memory and reflection. Third, we learned one October is forever marked not only by tragedy, but also by acts of kindness. People going out of their way to help others immediately and in the years that have followed. Fourth, we learn we should design for connection. Many spoke of something seemingly paradoxical, the beauty that has come out of tragedy. Out of senseless violence and loss, strangers became family. Inhumanity wrought newfound humanity. And through these relationships, we found meaning. Lastly, we were inspired by how, country, how community members talked about their love of country music, the magic of country music and its concert culture, the feeling of family, joy, and unexpected connections. And that at the very heart of country music is storytelling that speaks to us on a very personal level and brings people together. That is what we wanted to do here. So we tapped into the traditional structure of a country song, verse, bridge, and chorus, to help us tell this important story. So at the entrance to the memorial, we first learn about the events of 1 October, its enormous scale and impact on the Route 91 Harvest Festival and Las Vegas communities and across the America. Our journey begins with an embrace as its opening verse, the heartfelt greeting from one rooter to another. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you've made it here and you are here in the world with us. And what brings 22,000 people together? The walkway is lined with quotes and phrases from community members and country song lyrics. Meeting people from all different points of life some are just like you and some completely opposite, but you all have one thing in common. It takes people like you to make people like me, from the great Rocky Mountains to the shores of the sea, from the sands of the desert to the tall oak tree. It takes people like you to make people like me, Buck Owens. So human connection is at the core of being human. Now we approach the bridge. The bridge is a nexus point at the memorial where the paths of the opening and closing verses cross over one another. Our opening verse ramps downward into the surround, a peaceful sheltered area below the Tower of Light. It's an unexpectedly expansive interior space. It's the moment when a song transitions on stage Imagine 22,000 points of light slowly revealing crowdsource images of festival attendees, thousands of people of all walks of life, each light with its own delicate pulse. But together, they glimmer with the energy of music, sharing and creating something beautiful. Moving out of the surround into the remembrance ring, we are reminded that every person has a story. Each of the 58 was a wife, husband, partner, son, mother, best friend, mentor to someone. And so tucked into the landscape facing the 58 candles is the angel's wall, a quiet area for reflection to honor and remind us that these connections continue to live on in each of us. And, like lyrics in an unforgettable song, the stories of the 58 celebrate how each life, each light, 
carries on in the memories and lives they've touched. Each candle represents an angel, each light a story etched on the base, a brief bio, or perhaps a QR code that expands and activates that story on a personal device. But here, we can highlight an angel's cherished tradition, a philanthropic cause, or a favorite song. In our closing verse, surrounding the Tower of Light, we acknowledge the many acts of heroism and kindness in the immediate aftermath of the shooting. Here, stories intertwine with our search for meaning and purpose. I went back in nine times and carried people out. Nobody cared who you voted for or what color you were. We heard for many, this was just the beginning of a lifelong journey. Festival host Storm Warren recalled, everyone felt like they lost and found pieces of themselves there. And as we enter the Tower of Light, a moment of reflection and response to what we've witnessed. How do we come back from this? Messages for the world are etched on each pane of glass. Questions, words, and phrases crowdsourced from the Harvest Festival's 22,000 concert goers, conveying hopes and aspirations for the kind of world we want to create a world of generosity, compassion, empathy, love for each other, where it's natural to love your own kind, but it's supernatural to love all mankind. As the closing verse path descends from the tower, it spills out into a chorus of crisscrossing lines on the plaza that reflect the energy of the Route 91 Harvest community. We heard on that night Artists and concert goers became first responders. Emergency responders ran toward danger over and over again. Strangers helped strangers and continue to these many years later. These intersecting lines on the plaza are symbolic of the chorus of intersecting communities that make up Vegas strong. You have all become living examples of how each of us in our own small way can be a point of light in our families, communities, society. Each of us can make the world a better place for someone. Within the plaza lines, quotes and lyrics weave a picture. It's complicated, but I think we amazed the world. I learned you can never give up on people. Past sculptures evoking the joy of country music and its community animate planters and seating areas, perhaps a guitar, a cowboy hat, a Route 91 ribbon. They signal places where we might listen to stories on a personal device of unexpected connections, acts of kindness and bravery. One concert goer recalled, I saved her life, so she likes to tell people that I'm her hero, but I struggle with that word. I left that night feeling very alone in my experience. So that connection to her has saved me too. In one of our listening sessions, a community member expressed her hope that visitors to the memorial come away with the courage to connect. In this plaza, we want to celebrate the strength of, the strength in being human, a place where we are encouraged to connect with a stranger to be part of a welcoming, evolving community. We're so glad you're here. So we'd like to take you through the journey of the memorial. It really begins uh, entering into the memorial and being greeted by, I'm so glad that you're here. As you continue down the gentle ramp, you'll notice the rammed earth walls on the right-hand side. You can touch and feel and experience the rammed earth walls that are rising out of this desert floor. This is where the sacred soil is located. There's areas to sit and take refuge from, from the sun, all the while 
quotes and lyrics and educational moments being described on the wall to the left, the Tim Bavington sculpture rising overhead. As you begin to enter into the surround, this may be the smallest space on the site, but it's the most expansive. It's meant to be infinite space. As you get closer to the walls, the pixels become photos from the concert goers. Reflected floor and reflected ceiling will continue, will convey the idea of uh, infinity. Exiting out of the surround, a ramp will, gentle ramp will lead you up to the remembrance ring. This is just adjacent to Giles. It is lower in elevation. It's meant to be quiet, solemn, peaceful, contemplative. At night, the candles will glow, a subtle glow. The seating will allow for guests to sit and contemplate and reflect. As mentioned, the candles are three-sided. So one side would be the name, another side the, the image, and then the third being a description. We wanted to provide ample seating so that people could slow down and contemplate and reflect on the occurrences of what happened on that day, but also to reflect on the individuals themselves. The backdrop to the candles is the angel wall that you can see beyond. But linking all the candles together are these brass circles in the paving that link each candle to each other, essentially becoming one. The angel wall will be softly lit at night. It too will have its own seating. It's an area of refuge from the sun during the day. It's where the rammed earth wall extends overhead, the first of its kind in the world. It's also connecting you back to the rammed earth wall that begins to lead you northward to the community plaza. A subtle ramp leads you up to the Tower of Light. Here, the story continues. As Cynthia mentioned, there'll be etchings within the glass panels so that when you look up through the oculus, essentially you'll be viewing the messages that are sent to the world. Entering onto the community plaza, the journey continues. You can begin to follow lyrics and quotes in the paving. The planters are at different contours so it feels like small individual uh, canyons that you can circulate through. Bronze sculptures will be spread throughout the community plaza, guitars, cowboy boots, cowboy hat. The amphitheater itself overlooks the open lawn area. This is a space for gathering, for healing. Performances could occur here. Temporary stages could be erected but it's for the community. We view this as a gift for the community. And then finally, ending the journey on, we're so glad you're here. I wanna thank everybody for your time today and also thank you for your consideration. It's been an honor to work on this project. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna get started with our next presentation. And at this point, we're gonna hear from Aaron Newbert Architects, plus Studio Stitzgod. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Aaron Newbert, principal at Aaron Newbert Architects. I'm here with Martin Stitzgod, uh, Daryl Newbert, and Christopher Torres. On behalf of our team, uh, we want to express our deep appreciation to the One October Morrow Committee for the invitation to contribute to the community uh, healing um, journey uh, the last five months and for the distinct honor to present our memorial proposal to you today. There we go. Um, 
I would also like to thank the uh, Parks and Rec uh, from Clark County for their support and coordination during this complex and difficult process. <laughs> Most importantly, um, I wanna sincerely thank the community uh, members that welcomed us into their lives, um, sharing stories of their loved ones, families, and personal experiences. Uh, your feedback throughout our design process was invaluable towards uh, creating uh, and developing our proposal. Our submission would most certainly be very different without the spirit, love, and passion you brought uh, to our, our meetings and your consistent guidance, advice, criticism, and support throughout. Thank you uh, from our entire team. Uh, we came to you at our first community workshop meeting here in Las Vegas not sure uh, what a community for design process uh, would look like and where it would take us. We des described our objective to design the moral in collaboration with you, not as architects deployed to design a memorial for you, but as individuals with open ears and hearts to facilitate a process for the creation of an authentic and organic memorial to emerge. Our collective design explorations began with us learning about the celebrations of country music uh, you shared with your loved ones and how these memories continue to reverberate in your hearts. Our design grew stronger following the passionate conversations we shared at our workshops as we discussed approaches to capturing the healing journey you've lived and further defined our a flexible and inclusive uh, circulation strategy through personal connections we made during one-on-one -on -one meetings. As we gained your trust, you shared reflections of sadness and joy following the events of October 1st, your stories of seeking out silence and solace as a reprieve from your grief are embodied within the spaces of this memorial. The guiding questions uh, from our project emerge from the relationships we built with you I will highlight some of those questions here while Martin, Daryl, Chris, and I will look to expand on those uh, during our presentation. As we discussed in our last community meeting uh, at the end of May, for us, this is really the end of the beginning of this process with much more collaborative work to be done to achieve a memorial that fully embodies the resilience, spirit, and strength of your community. One of the first uh, guiding questions we uh, explored was how can the community participate in the creation of this memorial? The second was how can a memorial have multiple meetings and experiences, meeting each community, me member, community member where they are in their healing journey? We asked how can the memorial be formed and sculpted to create the healing properties of the desert in the center of Las Vegas? How can we preserve the shared community memories of the Route 91 Harvest Festival and the site that the festival was um, presented at? How can we design a memorial to be an immersive experience, including a range of sound experiences from live music to conversation to silence? How do we create a memorial that brings healing, unity, and remembrance for generations to come? I'm gonna pass uh, the mic over to Daryl. Thanks, uh, good evening. Uh, community outreach and engagement and participation was the central driving factor of our design process. The committee at first did a great job offering introductions to the identified stakeholders uh, from survivors, victim family members, first and emergency responders, community responders, and others interested in this memorial. This was our first step uh, invited into your community and it affected us greatly. And we learned a lot about the different paths you've all been on and our need to be sensitive to all those journeys. We knew we had to act really quickly to begin finding all those interested in participating and allowing for a multitude of ways for everybody to get involved. So we landed on a diverse approach uh, beginning with a memorial design survey um, and then we did uh, three community outreach sessions, uh, one face-to-face and two online. And then we also uh, 
held a final online behind the scenes session to kind of uh, reveal to everybody uh, the work we've done to date. Uh, so the goal is really to encourage participation throughout the process. <clears throat> we launched our survey immediately and that focused on the core values established by the committee and how those values can translate into a design. Uh, through analysis of those results, we immediately learned that the needs of the space were dynamic and sometimes contradictory. Uh, we boiled these needs quickly down to like three specific spaces, a place to quietly reflect, a place to actively learn, and a place to experience the joy and love of the entire community. Um, we were influenced by a lot of touch points along the way, but I'm going to hit on a few quickly here. That community de design workshop, uh, we launched that uh, three weeks into the process. So we really wanted to get uh, in front of everybody and uh, not only introduce ourselves, but introduce everybody into the design process itself. Um, at this face-to-face -face workshop, we took survivors, community responders, first responders, and any interested community member, uh, including uh, UNLV architectural professors and students, on this design journey from ideation, diagramming, modeling, and through presenting their four distinct memorials. Uh, this really had a deep impact on us, um, and, and, and listening to Route 91 Harvest Festival survivors described what they learned at our workshop and having them present their ideas to us um, just hit at a deeper level and affected our design process uh, throughout. Um, I was gonna say next slide, but I'm in charge of the slides. <laughs> oh, at that uh, event, um, we uh, met a wonderful community member who's working, uh, a writer who's working on her own uh, project related to Route 91. And we had a need, we identified early, this need to really get to know survivors, victim family members at a deeper level. Um, so we reached out to her and she volunteered her services to us to uh, connect with a few survivors and family members and kind of flesh out their journey to date um, so we could learn it more at a, at a deeper level. Um, and her work will be seen a little bit later uh, as we show our animation. In addition to uh, that, that particular community member, uh, we brought on another community member from the country music community, uh, a country music Midwestern uh, radio personality who has done uh, some talking trails, and he volunteered uh, his voice to our animations. <clears throat> uh, throughout the process, and I see some of you in here, uh, we had a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, we were able to meet with uh, a lot of the folks involved with the Healing Garden, um, to include Jay and Sue Ann and the group here today. Um, obviously, the Healing Garden is a super impactful place. Um, I'm sure we have our own remembrances of our first time stepping in there. Um, uh, but uh, their, their guidance throughout has been uh, super important. Uh, we also met with UNLV oral history staff, who provided us with the, the 75 uh, oral histories already collected and uh, researching those and sending those to our, um, to our pavilion design team has been an important part of the process. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? 50 seconds. Um, meeting with uh, family members of victims is always an emotional experience and through our contacts early on, um, and trusted people we met, we were able to meet with those victims' family members, and each one of them, as you know, is at a different point in their process of healing. Um, so that was an important thing we learned along the way, that this memorial needs, uh, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna mean different things to different people at, at different points in, in their journey. Um, <clears throat> and now I'd like to introduce uh, Martin, who's gonna talk about the design process. Yeah, thank you very much. And also thank you again to the community. So what I'll be doing is sort of a behind the scenes. So I'm not gonna reveal the glossy final product here, but I'm gonna try to tie the strings together of how we work with the community. This uh, for us as architect was a, obviously an unusual type of project. In a way that as architects, we usually have a building site that we need to react to. In this case here, we knew that this site was far more impactful than just the building site. One thing that uh, we came to understand with our initial meetings was 
that a lot of survivors, a lot of people hadn't even gone to the site afterwards. A lot of people had a very difficult time going back to the site. The site is a historic place. And for this reason, we don't want to just erase it. So there is an aspect of that that we, with community members, began to sort of explore how can that as an item be part of the process. So you will see sketches and models in my segment, but this is basically sort of the DNA for how this project has evolved. Um, sorry, one step back here. Uh, one important uh, meeting was Angela, who lost her son at this event here, and mentioned that she had come to Vegas every year for the last five years, but had not gone to the site. She has a great community. She's very appreciative for all you do here, but she hadn't visited the site. But she told us this year she finally went there, and some of the beautiful people you are actually created this event on the sidewalk next to it. It, was, it resonated with us that this site needed to be treated in a very, very specific way. So what we are doing here is that we're preserving pieces of the site. We are preserving two pieces of the grounds, the two orange areas that are the ultimate sacred ground. This is where people lost their lives. We're also preserving the tower, which was the only structure on site, as a beacon, but also as what was witnessing these historic events. When you fly into Las Vegas, the landscape is incredibly impactful. It's beautiful and amazing, and, but it also operates as a protective barrier for Las Vegas. That surrounding aspect was something that we talked to the community about, is perhaps an idea that we can incorporate into the design. As we began to evolve the memorial, there was a need for different types of spaces. You can almost talk about scales of spaces. There was the community space where you were talking about jar and celebrate uh, country music. Then there's a more intimate type of space where you talk with the family, you have a conversation, and then there's a space of solace. So the way the space is sort of divided was into these three segments. Those three segments needed to be set within a landscape. The landscape needed to be that buffer zone, that protective layer before you get to the memorial itself. Another very important aspect came as a first seed from Chris Munoz, who lost his wife at the event. He came to us and said, he flew all the way from New Mexico to meet us in January, and he basically said, I don't want to go to Las Vegas. I want a quiet place to remember my wife at. Okay, um, but what we realized was that the notion of sound is a huge, impactful aspect of this memorial. You can go from a concert to this complete quietness. So this section here is our initial sketch is showing this basically progression. So the section sketch shows that you are in an open sky, you have the bustling from the city and so forth, and as you progress into the memorial, it gets more and more quiet. These sketches also begin to elaborate on the different types of spe spaces that you would come through, the, different, the three different spaces, basically. Another, obviously, important aspect was that as we are learning that each individual member of the community have a different journey, it was almost like a different place in that journey. You couldn't compare it one to one. But one thing that was certain was that we had to unify it. It had to be a continuous experience. In some way, you all had to be tied together because this was a shared experience. In our studies, we found that the ribbon would be able to accommodate this, that there was a continuous ribbon, an unbroken ribbon, that would be this concluding factor that would take and define these spaces. In beginning to articulate the ribbon, we went back to the landscape again. And in this case, was inspired by some of the vegetation in the desert, there's horrors. This served as a, a means for us to create something so the enclosure itself would create the necessary privacy, but also a porosity so you could look out to the landscape and not feel enclosed. So the other thing that we have learned through our study models is the fact that the shading, the shading coming through this model is almost like an instrument. It's constantly changing over the surface of the pavement as the sun 
comes around this thing here in progression. This is sort of a first overview of it. And I think we are ready for the first animation. Need your help, Nikki. Thank you. The memorial site has been carefully considered and designed to pay homage to the sacred ground where the tragedy occurred. By preserving two sections of the existing asphalt and a small tower, both witnesses to the event, the memorial honors the victims and the history of the site. The memorial enclosure, a unity ribbon, serves as a physical and symbolic boundary, separating the sacred grounds of remembrance from the bustling urban environment. When providing protection and privacy, the transparent nature of the unity ribbon allows for visual connections to the surrounding landscape, fostering a sense of openness and harmony. The memorial's perimeter walls will curate only desired views, creating a contrast to the surrounding urban environment and providing visitors with a peaceful and reflective space. Landscape. The landscape is a series of five gardens inspired by the rugged beauty of the Mojave Desert and the mountain ranges forming the Las Vegas Valley Basin creating a framework for a botanical experience featuring a canyon forest, super bloom bars, healing spring well, sculptural arroyo, and an urban garden. The memorial landscape is resilient and sustainable, reconnecting the site to its natural ecology with native and climate appropriate plantings. Remembrance Walk. The Remembrance Walk connects the streetscape with the memorial, its landscape, and the community green. The walk has seven gardens located within the Mojave-inspired landscape, where visitors find more traditional and descriptive accounts of the first responders, civilian responders, community response, and mental health professionals most affected by the tragedy. The Heroes Tower and Memento Fence featured in the area serve as a living artifact and provide the opportunity for continued remembrance and connection to the event and the community's massive response. Community Green. The Community Green serves as a warm communal park, welcoming locals and visitors alike to the site. The Community Green will also serve as a platform and gathering space for the many events already established within the Route 91 Harvest Festival community. Nestled amongst a busy commercial corner, the urban garden helps decompress the visitor from the hustle and bustle of the entertainment district and begins the grounding of their journey into the sacred memorial space. Healing Pavilion. After exploring the Clark County Museum artifacts and engaging with the community to grasp the narrative surrounding the event, we firmly believe the addition of an interpretive center will add a significant and resonant aspect to the memorial program. The Healing Pavilion will facilitate immersive storytelling, outreach initiatives, and educational programming, fostering profound connections and ensuring sustainable relevance for future generations.
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. My name's Chris, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the overall site experience that you just got a preview of in that animation. And so we really thought about a memorial that's designed for healing, really trying to meet each, each victim's family where they are. And so this is showing an overall plan drawing of the project. You'll see at the core, there's the three main experiences of the area for silence and solace, concert, conversations and connections and celebrations and reverberations. And then around the site, a series of other public spaces that we'll talk about now. So as mentioned, there's five landscapes that are really inspired by the Mojave, each creating a, a different type of experience. We are really thinking about how do you kind of sample and remix the desert in a very kind of interesting way, providing different experiences at each moment in the memorial. So this diagram begins to show the different planting typologies, as we would call them, different ways that we use landscape to really create an immersive environment. Here you could see a kind of a sectional drawing across the whole memorial. And one thing we did um, spend a lot of time was kind of sculpting topography and landform. So in the canyon forest, you'll notice that the memorial is actually encased into the earth. And then as the topography moves across the page, you'll notice that it slopes down. So it's in that sloping that we're actually capturing water, collecting that water and reusing that throughout the year to irrigate the landscape. So the urban green, this community garden at the corner is a really important space. One thing that we heard many times over and again from the community is to not over program the project. And so this is an opportunity for the space to be activated in new ways to come in the future. So this is really a gift back to the city in a new public plaza. That urban garden really is focused on shade and cooling. We know that shade is critical for folks to actually use the space. So a, a whole variety of different trees and plantings would um, come into that space. Here's a couple of views. So here's a view coming out of the memorial, going north towards Las Vegas, towards the Strip. You'll notice the amount of shade and seating and different opportunities for programming here. And then a view back towards into the memorial. This portal really creates a threshold between the city and what we would consider a more sacred space for healing. This is a view back at the interpretive center that you'll notice is, is kind of buried in the landscape and that's very intentional. The focus is really about finding places for folks to heal. It's really not about an overall gesture, but it's creating different ways for people to come together. The healing spring well is what we call the inner gardens of the memorial. So there's those three spaces that we'll talk a little bit more about, but the overall landscape here is really focused and inspired by when when rivers and tributaries come together in the desert. There's these moments of life, of verdant life that come alive in the desert. What are those plantings? How can we capture water? How can we reuse water in the smartest way to kind of create those environments? And so here's a view of the garden through that spring well. The canyon forest is part of what we call the remembrance walk, which has two pieces. So there's this canyon forest element, and then we also call this sculptural arroyo piece but this is really a linear, almost outdoor gallery. Think of it as an outdoor art gallery where we could feature both temporary but also permanent artwork nestled into the landscape. So the canyon forest, really inspired by the most verdant, the most green, almost, almost hilltop type planting you'll find in desert planting communities. And so you'll notice here the topography begins to slope up and really engage with this unity ribbon so it's planting, it's art, which is critical to this project, and it's this overall ribbon piece coming together to create the experience. So here along the Canyon Forest, you'll notice these kind of pockets. And so these become moments where we could feature different artwork, both temporary and permanent. And the sculptural arroyo uses maybe the most sculptural planting we find in the Mojave and brings that all together into one space. And we, we create this kind of walk along the project with these art moments. And so here you can see there's actually peaks and views through into the memorial. So there's a high level of visual transparency here. We wanna make sure that this feels light and airy. There's also many different ways to come in and out of the memorial. There isn't one way in, one way out. You'll notice the tower that we're keeping as an artifact, as a sacred artifact of the site and an, and a, an idea of how folks could engage with that through public art. And then this idea of what we could call the super bloom bars. So how do we create dynamic change in the garden? 
we're changing. Our stories are changing. Even in this time we've had together, we've been so deeply impacted by it. We felt that it was important that the landscape did that as well. And so one idea is to bring together planting that blooms seasonally into these kind of more geometric moments that every time you come, something is different. And so you'll notice the bars coming across the landscape. And the way we achieve that is really through the careful grading of the site. So the landscape actually kind of molds and forms, creating these small valleys where water is gathered and captured throughout the year. Something that we thought was very important is that every material, every choice tells a story. And so how can materials tell a story of unity? We fell in love with these Greek and Roman uh, mosaics that told stories. And we started thinking, hey, can we tell a story with the hardscape itself? And so one idea is that we would love to work with the families and communities across the nation, actually go there and source material from those areas, creating this geologic quilt of the hardscape bringing together a whole tapestry of materials and colors. I think when we do that, we forever bond together our site and the communities across the whole nation that have been impacted by this. At the same time, the rest of the materials are locally sourced. We think it's incredibly important that we think about how we decarbonize this project, how we create a sustainable, resilient place, and we use the most local materials when we can. So I'm gonna hand this over to talk about the Healing Pavilion. So really quickly, um, we established a need for a pavilion or some form of interpretive center to really tell these stories and give them the justice they deserve. Um, so we reached out to Oklahoma City Memorial and we met with them and kind of learned from them how they handle the memento process as well as how they handled iterations of their design over the past uh, 20 or so years. As you know, um, what we know today changes with time as more people come forward and more stories are revealed. So we felt a healing pavilion was essential to this project, not only its sustainability of the narrative, but also financial sustainability in the future. Thank you. The healing journey begins in the pavilion. It is the place where visitors understand the enormity of what happened the night of October 1st, 2017. It is where they learn about the tragedy and the heroism. It is where they see the community's response and become a part of it. And it is where they learn about and connect to the long process of recovery. It is a place to document, educate, honor, and overcome. As visitors enter the pavilion, they peer through a scrim showing an image of the Route 91 Harvest Festival and see glimpses of memorial crosses just beyond it. Joy and unexpected tragedy in a single impression. Ambient audio fills the space. The mood is both warm and familiar, the feeling of the concert juxtaposed with unease, the knowledge of what's to come. On the other side of the scrim, visitors experience the stark contrast between the crowd of people dancing and the stillness of 58 handmade memorials to the lives lost that day. The mood here is somber, the decibel level in the room lower. It is quiet, but not silent. A simple statement wrapping the perimeter walls provides context for the visitor. When they look closely, visitors can see the individual faces of those who died on October 1st, taking a private moment to recognize and honor them. A sign alerts them that sensitive content appears in the following galleries so that they can make a choice about whether to proceed or go outside directly to the memorial. As visitors move into the next area, the space becomes darker reflecting the time of day when the shooting took place and the tragedy itself. This area reflects what happened that day, 
through both the sequence of events and accounts of those who experienced them. There are private moments to hear the memories and emotions of survivors, sharp amidst the blur of all that happened. The walls around the perimeter convey the chaos of that night through a timeline punctuated by cell phone footage from attendees, communications teams, and first responders. At the end of the gallery, visitors learn that the gunman is dead, having killed himself when law enforcement officers tried to enter his room. As visitors move into the next space, they're enveloped by the objects, images, and words of support that flooded in as the tragedy unfolded. The gallery is a tribute to the heroes who responded and continue to respond to the trauma of October 1st, as well as the local and even global community that reached out and stood up to help. The process of healing from the trauma and loss that night is ongoing. In the following space, visitors hear survivors discuss their journey. Wrapping the room are joyful tributes to those who died. Friends and family can share everyday images of their loved ones, a celebration of who they were and how they will be remembered. Survivors have made clear that country music is not just what brought them together on October 1st, but also what has helped them to heal. So this final space reverberates with song. Survivors and families of those who died will be invited to submit the songs as well as dedications to pair with them. They will become the playlist for this space of listening and reflecting, and visitors can choose what they want to hear. On the walls surrounding the listening area is a subtle pattern evocative of a chain, recalling the human chain survivors formed around the festival site. Within it, visitors can write messages that further strengthen the community of support. From here, visitors leave the pavilion to continue their journey of healing outside in the memorial. The GNA team would like to thank you for sharing your stories, which have inspired the vision for the Healing Pavilion. Uh, the, more, the memorial of the Unity Ribbon um, is the most sacred space uh, on our site uh, and is essentially a a em embracing and uh, collective um, wall, uh, transparent, allowing light and air to enter, providing shade and shadow. The Unity Ribbon envelops the sacred spaces and serves as a lasting tribute to those who lost their lives. The three spaces in the Unity Ribbon are, uh, we've named um, Celebrations of Reverberations. This is a space that is open to the sky, a space for children, a space for joy, music, and celebrations. Uh, in our next animation, we'll talk about the one proposed artwork in that space called Always On My Mind. The second space uh, called Conversation and Connections, this space honors those who answered the call in the seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years following the tragedy. Uh, this space has views to the Heroes Garden 
and the protective forest. The last space inside the memorial is silence and solace. This space honors the 58 as the most sacred uh, area within the memorial. A glass halo floating above the prefer, pre preserved site records the names of the 58 while victim stories are engraved in the walls. And I'm gonna play our last uh, animation. Unity Ribbon. Inspired by the community's deep connection to country music and the site's connection to the breathtaking landscapes of Las Vegas, the design aims to navigate and convey the broad range of emotions associated with this event and its aftermath. Drawing inspiration from natural elements such as the Colorado River, carving through the Mojave Desert, the graceful contours of a guitar, the resilient form of a cactus, and the ancient fossil beds of Thule Springs, our memorial enclosure rises from the landscape as a symbol of unity. Celebrations and reverberations. This space marks the beginning of the memorial's chronological narrative and embodies the celebratory spirit of country music. It stands as the most expansive area within the memorial inviting visitors to witness the juxtaposition between the exuberance of country music and the unifying power of the community. The flags, custom designed with the families of the 58, families of those who lost their lives following the event, and additional community groups fly at the top of the sculpture and create a formation reminiscent of an eternal flame. Conversations and Connections. Those who made it out knew about survivor's guilt. They talked about depression, fear, anxiety, exhaustion, anger, despair, and the lingering effects of trauma. Above all, they helped heal one another's hearts by sharing their respective stories and are slowly rebuilding their sense of safety together. Of course, the path to healing is not always linear and differs wildly for everyone. Many still suffer from debilitating physical and mental injuries, and others have found strength in helping others. But what is true for all is that they unconditionally embraced and are embraced by their fellow survivors. A sentiment best summed up by what survivors say when they greet one another. I'm glad you're here. Silence and solace. Within our memorial, we have dedicated a space known as Silence and Solace to honor the 58 victims who were lost the night of the tragedy, holding deep reverence and serving as the utmost sacred grounds within the memorial. From above, light diffused by the oculus tracks the path of sun and passage of time. The centerpiece is a segment of asphalt preserved from the site of the event. Above the pavement, at waist level, a large floating translucent glass halo will be suspended, providing a designated location for each victim to be honored, fostering a sense of openness and harmony. Our design creates spaces that celebrate the power of music, the impact of community and dialogue, and the enduring memory of those we have lost. The memorial encapsulates moments of joy, reflection, contemplation, and sorrow, inviting all individuals to enter, regardless of where they may be in their personal healing journey. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next group, 
that will be sharing their design information is SWA Group. Good evening. We're so excited to be here today and actually to love on you guys. Uh, it's been a long journey for us, longer for you. We are SWA team, I'm Natalia, and here to introduce my brilliant uh, team of artists, design professionals, incredible people, very passionate about this project. Norman, Daniel, Elizabeth, Shane, Olivia, Joe, <laughs> Andrew, Erica, Troy and Vicky, and Claire. So we're all here today, everybody who worked on this project because we are uh, incredibly excited at, at the opportunity to reveal our vision. And we're also excited to see some familiar faces in the room today uh, and also meet those who are watching and listening tonight. What a culmination of an effort by the county, by the community, and all of the designers here in the room today. We would like to thank the One October Committee for inviting us on this journey and helping us transform as people and as designers. 10 months ago, uh, we stepped into this process with empathy and understanding. We believed that conversation required respect, openness, and time in order to evolve into a vision that can unite, inspire, and provide hope. Our ambition is that this concept, resonant memory, meaningfully honors the lives cut short in those forever altered by the tragedy of October 1, 2017. Our inspiration, our starting point, are the 58 lives who must not be forgotten. Despite the sadness of their loss, we are inspired to continue sowing the love that is rippling far because of them. Country songs always tell a personal story. The lyrics carefully describe a person, a place, or event through a narrative arc. Our concept is about everyone's personal story, thousands of them. It is inspired by the shared love of country music, a love that brought people from all over to the Route 91 Harvest Fest, shoulder to shoulder in a shared communal celebration. And here's how the arc of the story unfolds in our vision for the memorial. We envision the acoustic guitar, the most emblematic representative instrument of country music, as a, a symbol for the beloved community of the 58 and a recurrent motif in our design. As artists and designers, we became particularly interested in the element of the sound hole that is at the center of the guitar. We became interested in how the sound hole allows the vibration of the air within the sound chamber to emanate out and propagate into the air, amplifying the music that's being played. We became interested in this really interesting metaphor of having, having something that has been removed but amplifying something else. So to us, this created an interesting paradox and really created this design tension that I think was very um, rich in our design. As such, we envision the memorial, memorial itself as an instrument, an instrument that takes the absence left behind by the 58 and amplifies your memory through our celebration of life of the 58. And this is exemplified in the, in the mantra and the phrase, country strong. As we started to focus on this elements of the sound hole and also the rosette, which is this, uh, this meticulously adorned uh, motif that articulates and reinforces this, this, this circular element, new meaning started to emerge that really helped and added and enriched our design. For one, the sound hole of an acoustic guitar is unique to other stringed instruments that may be in a F shape or a D shape or a C shape. The circular form is an archetypal, universal symbol of unity, community, harmony, and love. And the sound hole itself within the body of the guitar, as seen from these images to the right, uh, viewed from in, inside the guitar, is a threshold from lightness to darkness to, to inner and outer. And for us, this really spoke to this idea, this narrative journey of healing, as one emerges from the darkness to the light 
and also works at this healing process internally and also publicly as a community. But the element of the rosette, this, this interesting uh, circular uh, piece, this motif that's very much identified with the acoustic guitar, to us um, spoke, uh, the, the, spoke to the ability of a musician to really express themselves individually um, through a custom treatment of this particular element. And to us, that was really consistent with this idea of the spirit of country and Western music, which is about freedom, about the, 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 wa the vast expanse of the American West and independence. This framing device in our design is interpreted as ocular or oculus moments, framing devices that prompts visitors to look up towards the heaven into the sky. As we envision the ever-changing Las Vegas sky as an apparatus of healing. As one is in the strip and they're immersed in these, these, these artificial buildings and these lights, the only area of nature that is present is what's above you. And we really wanted to have something where nature infuses the, the design. And speaking about the relationship between the musician and the, and the guitar, um, when you hold a guitar or cradle a guitar, it's a very, um, it, it's, it's almost like the musician and the guitar is, is intertwined in a seamless embrace. And this idea of an embrace was something that had dual meaning for us in terms of the design and, and the narrative of, of, our, of our proposal. For one, you think of an embrace of a community, people loving each other, but there's also the embrace of protecting someone. So, so during, during the, the night of the tragedy, people were cradled and carried to, to, to safety. And this idea of both protection and love and embrace, this dual meaning was a really important part of, of our proposal. As we started to, to, to work out the site plan, defining the spaces, defining the pathways, of course, the, the acoustic guitar, the contours of acoustic guitar factored heavily in our design. But there were other aspects that were really critical to how we define these spaces and these pathways. One is the creation of the rosettes, which is a very meticulous process using very ref refined, ma refined materials. They often take linear forms that start out as perfectly straight, and you have to carefully, tangentially integrate it into, into this, this recess of the circle. So those curving forms also start to echo the curving forms of a guitar. Of course, um, the hourglass, the passage of time, um, the, this, 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 this notion of, of, of an infinity was also re really important in, in, in the, the design. And of course, the country strong ribbon itself. And all these components, together collectively created a, a harmony of elements that, that create these kind of spatial moments that, that unfold and create this journey of hope, healing, and memory. So I'm gonna take you on a walkthrough of the spaces, elaborating on the sequence of experiences you'll have along the way. When you arrive at the site, you'll arrive at uh, East Reno Ave and Guile Street in an arrival plaza. And you'll, be, you'll, first, you'll first encounter three flags, the American flag, the Nevada state flag, and the Clark County flag, each marking the site and the location where the tragedy occurred. Moving forward, you'll approach a tactile map which really will set the, set the stage for, for what people are about to walk through in the experience. Um, there'll be a statement on this, on this plaque, which describes the events of the day and the starting point of this journey. The shooter will not be named in the retelling of this story. Moving deeper into the site, landforms sort of converge on the left and right of you, pulling you into the space. And on the right, you'll see the feature we're calling the Wall of Embrace. The Wall of Embrace was inspired by the landforms and geolog geological formations locally and that were formed by wind and rain and water over time, carving away the edges. And this, this feature is really chronological in nature. And as you move from the exterior to the interior, 
it will retell the narratives of that day from the first minutes to the first hours and through the years, the stories of the concert goers and then the first responders, police, fire, and healthcare. Then to the lar larger Las Vegas community and the outpouring support in the weeks and days and weeks to come. And then the larger community of the country and moving forward the story of the mental health support network that built around the tragedy. And we are all very moved by the relics and mementos that appeared, the temporary, temporary memorial at the Las Vegas sign. And you know, these objects, the teddy bears and candles and flowers, were all temporary in nature. And we thought it would be interesting and powerful to remember and preserve some of these elements as permanent bronze statues embedded in niches in the wall of embrace. So these individual elements, you'll be able to scan one of them with your phone and link to the digital archive, which will tell stories of people in the Route 91 community, first responders, and also have links to the Resiliency Center and grief resources. We're working with a material of bronze, which is extremely durable, which develops a beautiful patina over time at the, the touch of a human hand. And we're working with a, a sculptor on our team, Troy Kelly, who specializes in the use of bronze. Visitors will also be encouraged to leave flowers and candles in this location, making it an ongoing living tribute to community response and community outpouring in the face of tragedy. Moving forward, you'll see our next feature, which is called, which is called the Pavilion of Unity. And from the outside, the pavilion appears with very fine columns to be almost like a stringed instrument or rain falling in the desert. The interior of this space was inspired by the sound hole of the guitar as viewed from the interior, the area where, the, where, where sound resonates out and light pours in. The Pavilion of Unity is, is a communal space in an acoustical venue designed to enhance the sound. This, this space can hold hundreds of people for anniversary events, or can it be a place of solitary reflection for an individual person? And when you look up to the ceiling in this space is the oculus, which punctuates the sky and lets light in. It's an open air pavilion. And that, that the frame of that pavilion is what we're calling the oculus, is lined with 58 individual onyx panels, which are translucent, which will let light through. And they're meant to evoke the mother of, mother of pearl inlays on guitars, like the rosette, which Norman described, as well as the theme of the circular element of the theme of wholeness and unity, as well as light pouring through darkness. And so as the day changes, you'll see light move through the space, and you'll, see, you'll, you'll feel the passage of time, which is a part of the healing process. Emerging from the Pavilion of Unity, you have the option of going onto a perimeter path, which we're calling the Path of Healing. And the Path of Healing is immersed and embedded in a, in a bosque of tall pine trees native to Nevada. These pine trees are meant to have a calming effect. The sound of wind in the pines, the, smells, the smell of the pines, and the habitat created for birds and pollinators are all meant to calm and soothe people along this journey, as well as wind chimes we have hanging in the trees which add to the overall effect of calm. And from above, on the path which goes around the perimeter, you'll be able to look down onto the Rosette Garden, which is the most sacred part of this memorial. And the Rosette Garden structure of it was inspired by the six strings of a guitar and those six strings where sound resonates were interpreted as six monumental cables spanning the length of the garden, which become a scaffolding for the rosettes to hang. 58 rosettes for 58 individuals, 58 halos, a suspended field above us, a spiritual plane. We, we have this sense with lost loved ones that they're with us, but we can't see them, that we can 
feel them, but we can't touch them. And there they are floating above us, protecting us, looking down on us, each individual, standing shoulder to shoulder like people in the concert that day, all together in unity. In this rosette garden, you will be able to feel in one fell swoop the, effect, the, the, full, the full size of the 58 all at once, the enormity of the tragedy. The structure is both very thin, but yet very enormous in its scale. And each of these individual rosettes have a unique color and pattern. And you can take your phone, take a picture of that rosette, and that will link directly to a biography of that individual in the digital archive. And it will tell the story of that person. Pictures, videos, handwritten letters, really get a sense of the individuality of that, of that, of that person, 58 unique individuals. The spirit of country music is really about freedom, self-expression, individuality. We want, to, we want to encourage that with these individual rosettes. The process of grieving is different for everybody. So we like the idea that you can move freely underneath, underneath the rosette gardens, but we're, we're proposing a, a, cus, a rocking chair which you can move and create small groupings. You can sit alone, lay back, look up at the rosettes protected by the pine trees all around you. You can create small circles with families. You can create large circles. The flexibility is yours to grieve and honor as you, as you please. Now looking back in the other direction is a feature called the Arc of Remembrance. In the Arc of Remembrance, you'll approach and you'll see 58 twinkling lights in the ground meant to reflect the night sky. On the interior of the Arc of Remembrance is a statement in honor of those who have lost their lives in the aftermath of the event and those that can continue to feel mental and physical trauma. On the other side is portraits of all 58 individuals embedded in stone with their names inscribed. You'll be able to leave flowers here, tokens, mementos for your lost loved one. At night, the halos glow, giving up a warm glow, which will become another feature in the skyline. Looking down, you'll always experience and see the 58 at all times from above. So they'll always be part of the, of the, the fabric of Las Vegas. All of the inspirations flow from the Route 91 stories, what we learned and read as the project got started. But we also heard from the committee how vital the community input should be, and so our most important inspirations come from connections that we made. The people that we spoke with personally, those who responded to our surveys, and those who emailed in messages and ideas. But more than any news article or online report or op-ed, the community helped us understand the nuance of your story. You added meaning and sketched the character of the Route 91 family, and you gave us a window onto the burden that the community carries still. But more importantly, you also shared bravery and selflessness and a hope for the future, and this is what we hope that resonant memory captures. Our strategy provided the community some options in how to get in touch with us. Um, we knew that the committee had started by gathering quantitative data through its surveys, so our first impulse was to pivot to qualitative data. Through listening sessions, which were small group one-on-one -on -one set conversations with the design team, we provided a place for honest questions and honest answers. These were conversations with a poet, who's in the audience today, a grandfather, a mother, sisters. We also spoke with an immigrant advocate and a nonprofit who represent the experiences of thousands who are too often overlooked. The listening sessions helped idea, design ideas take shape, and next we developed a process to stress test those ideas. So the team attended a variety of local events in Las Vegas, the Bluegrass Festival, First Friday, Symphony Park Fine Arts Festival. There was a session at Cadwallader Middle School with educators. We also hosted an open house at the Resiliency Center. The team engaged in dozens of conversations and we answered questions. There was also a vital visual survey. This is a collection of inspiration images that we simply asked people to respond to. The survey gave us the gut reactions of the community and helped steer the design ideas that you're seeing today. 
And the survey is also online, and to date we've received 115 responses. The team synthesized those responses, and this showed us the community spectrum of preferences. The survey data validated what became the core principles of the design, including about the use of color and light, how to use the nightscape and nature. And for one example, like you're seeing in the first row with color, 80% of people who responded indicated a preference for a joyful palette, something that conveyed the spirit of celebration and of life. So we emulated that in the design. From the start, our approach, we hope, has been open door. We reached out as broadly as possible through news and local TV coverage, multi-channel social media campaign, community networks, and good old plain, of, plain word of mouth helped us spread the invitation. We believe that the memorial has to be a meaningful experience for everyone that has a Route 91 story. So one of our key efforts was to reach the Spanish-speaking community. All of our engagement opportunities have been offered in Spanish, and moving forward, we are committed to a bilingual design that is also sensitive to the culture and celebrations of the whole Las Vegas community. Daniel mentioned the Memorial app, which is one of our key storytelling features. This is also a key accessibility element for us. It can deliver not only audio description, but also assisted listening and multiple languages. We feel that this will help the memorial provide a truly equitable and universal experience for everyone who comes. <laughs> to us, all of this was a pilot program. This is just the start of what we hope is an enduring relationship with you. We see that your input is vital to the development of everything that you've seen so far, whether it's creating a rosette for one of the 58 or choosing between some options and features, or helping us populate that digital archive of stories that we hope will continue to evolve and enrich over the years. We also are committed to engaging local artists and artisans from metalsmiths or stone suppliers, because we understand that this is a landmark in their city too, and we want to give them a way to also contribute. Through community engagement, we hope and believe that this memorial can be both for, but also by the Las Vegas community. It is with the thoughts and feedback from you that we established the framework for the memorial. To be a place of hope, not darkness. It would speak to varied life journeys after the tragedy and help the Route 91 family come together in solace, but also a celebration of love and music. We learned very nuanced things from families of the deceased, friends, survivors, therapists, artists, and everyone who contributed to the creative expression process. We translated what we heard into nine design strategies for spaces that bring peace and healing to future memorial visitors. The first strategy is creating room for creative expression. The act of creation is healing in and of itself. We developed spaces for making art, small exhibits, performances, and sound booths where, where more people can, to can talk and oral histories can be recorded. Mindful of the Route 91 family gatherings and their special needs, we sized these spaces to comfortably accommodate anywhere between a group of five or a crowd of a thousand. All the outdoor spaces offer flexibility and variety of use over time. The indoor space is also a flexible room that can accommodate up to 100 people for a meeting, art therapy, yoga, or documentary screenings. This respects the fact that people heal on different timelines. We hope that you come back to the memorial transformed year after year and experience it differently. The second strategy is about movement. The very movement through the memorial is designed to be therapeutic. We wanted people to feel as if they're floating through the site through over the continuous shaded paths that are very calming, interconnected, there are curves and loops that allow for walking experience to be very meditative. The third strategy is shield and protection. The frame of the memorial is a landform that shields guests from triggering viewshed of Mandalay Bay. This is that thrust of an arm and gesture of an embrace we wanted to capture to allow visitors to be at peace and, and be present in the moment. The fourth strategy is comfort. Comfort in the desert, of course. It needs to be a fundamental quality of the site that makes people want to come here and visit. 
We applied special rigor in creating a cooling environment through shade and breezes and did multiple studies to achieve that effect. A small air-conditioned enclosure with restrooms allows visitors to linger and enjoy the place for longer period, periods of time. And this is our model that you cannot, unfortunately, um, unpack because it's under glass. We imagine that the small interior space can be an outpost for mental health resources from the resiliency center, for example. We heard from you that providing a quiet place is very important. The silence and nature soundscapes of the healing garden is one of the great qualities that makes that experience so calming and magical. We mitigate the negative sound effects of the airport, the Las Vegas Strip, and adjacent roadways with perimeter walls and berms. These are very carefully developed tools that help transform this noisy site into a place where quiet contemplation and acoustical performances are actually possible. The fifth strategy is to immerse the visitor in nature. The memorial will become a greener oasis on the Strip. Its forms allude to the mountains and canyons of the surrounding desert. Its plant palette is as resilient as it is comforting and authentic. Birds and insects enliven the garden with movement and sound. Seasonal changes ground guests in the healing power of nature. In the spring, migratory birds may stop by on their way to nor northern mating grounds. The stately pines for form an evergreen backdrop to the garden. In time, pulsating blooms and textures of spring give way to the delicate foliage of summer. With fall, the garden canvas changes color and texture once again. Native insects and birds find home in the delicate branches that prepare for winter. The sixth strategy is capturing progression of time. While seasonality of the blooming cycle is a reminder of time passing, light is yet another medium to capture change and with change, healing progressing ahead. Strategy seven is to respect the human body in all states and abilities. Children, the elderly, the wounded, families, and we want to engage all senses. When we spoke with the trauma therapist, Jackie Harris of the Resiliency Center, she told us that for her clients, every trigger is related to the five senses. And conversely, everything that can help and that can help soothe is related to the five senses. Presence of music is our, is our strategy number eight. Music inspires the visual form, atmosphere, and the, speci and the sp special program of the memorial. The forms of an acoustic guitar, country music motifs, and the performance space within the Pavilion of Unity speak directly to the fact that the music got interrupted at the site, but it should not stop. Strategy nine is about the importance of gathering and human connection. From our conversations with you, we learned that maintaining community connections is largely what makes moving on possible. The memorial offers places where Route 91 family can casually gather for celebrations, and communal remembrance rituals. Expression of patriotism at the entry flag plaza and aggregation of heroic narratives along the wall of embrace further bring comfort in the expression of unity. The lived experiences of, of the tragic event and its aftermath are endlessly varied. The memorial needs to provide choice for the visitor to curate their own personal journey through the spaces. Now and over time, as they progress in their healing process. This approach allows for, for me as a visitor to choose openness or enclosure, public interaction or private contemplation, exposure to or avoidance of information that's potentially re-traumatizing. This built-in variety and sensitivity to choice will hopefully feel welcoming to all. As a gun violence survivor, as a child, and as an artist, I feel a deep responsibility to help people experience healing through the arts. Art is a reflection of the human condition and acts as a record of our collective memories. It's how we honor and keep history alive in our communities. It can nurture resilience and a sense of connectedness to not feel alone in grappling with the complex life situations. The Las Vegas Community Healing Garden reflects that sentiment, providing refuge for healing while celebrating each life lived. 
We were inspired by how family and friends of the 58 contributed personalized objects such as cowboy hats, artworks, mementos. And so we wanted to capture this level of individualization. Art helps us heal, connect, and remember. The bronze sculptures in the Wall of Embrace remember. They immortalize a moment in time when we were all united, mourning, and offering support. The beloved objects left by community members became precious as symbols of our humanity. The Rosette Gardens canopy of 58 colored glass rosettes suspended overhead celebrate the lives of lost loved ones. Symbolically, the rosettes have been separated from their instrument and ascend into the sky, becoming heavenly bodies tethered to the earth through our collective memories. As musicians express their individuality with decorative rosettes on their guitars, the rosettes here also express the unique stories of each fallen concert goer. We will work with local artists as a voice of the Las Vegas creative community and family and friends to develop these expressions. Together, we will distill colors of the desert sky and meaningful patterns into a distinct palette. Teal for Bailey, green for Denise, and topaz for Jennifer. Each rosette will contain a name on an inner band with cutout letters to allow light to pass through them. These colors and patterns will cast shadows throughout the day as the sun moves across the sky, constantly shifting as a living memorial. Rosettes are also universal symbols for resilience. The various forms of rosette carvings or stained glass windows of a church, voice a spiritual allegiance, the desert rose speaks to perseverance in a hostile climate, and the rose tattoo we carry with us as a reminder of enduring love. We were inspired by the Las Vegas Portraits Project, where artists around the world dedicated their personal talents to create a portrait of one of the 58, culminating in a public exhibit. Individually, these are tremendous acts of compassion. As a whole, it represents unity and fellowship. Expanding on this notion to capture a likeness through a handmade expression, we want to aid in the healing through an interactive opportunity that is a therapeutic exercise to help process difficult emotions by creating something tangible. In addition to the forever touchstones of permanent portraits of each of the 58, the Ark of Remembrance Wall of Healing will promote healing for children and adults in the act of rubbing of a portrait or a name. This is a truly intimate and unique artwork created by the hands of the visitor. These experiences and all the participatory programming opportunities for visitors and performers will aid in the healing process while honoring all who were touched by this event. This site will become a living memorial, but also evolve with the community. So in conclusion, uh, we really, um, we have this image here of, of the memorial in the context of Las Vegas, and we understand that this will be a place where people from all over the world will come to see. But we really want this to be a place for the community, of, like the community of, of the families, the grieved, the community of the survivors, the community of country music to rebuild, and the residents of Las Vegas to honor and pay tribute. And we hope that this memorial can resonate for hundreds of years from now so that people can come and hear stories, not of the evil that occurred that day, but of stories of bravery and kindness and love. So in conclusion, we, we want to show a video, um, but we'd like to thank you for, for listening to us and, and helping you on your mission.
If I could ask you all one last time to take your seats, we will proceed. Thank you all very much. Our final group here to pr present to all of us tonight is Paul M Murdoch Architects plus team. Thank you. I'm Paul Murdoch, architect. I'm James Young, a cultural historian of memorials and memory. I'm Elena Murdoch, I'm an architect. I'm Keith Helmetag, an exhibit designer and experience designer. Hi, my name is Chris Atanasio, and I'm a landscape architect. In this memorial, we honor the memory of the 58 victims who were murdered on October 1st, 2017 at the Route 91 Harvest Festival, the deadliest mass shooting in American history. We remember the 58 victims who died that evening in the architectural figure of angels' wings, an echo and homage to how the community of families of lost loved ones, survivors, first responders, emergency and emergency responders refer to these innocent victims. Here we also remember the courage of first responders, <clears throat> law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency medical teams, all as guardian angels who saved so many lives. We also remember the hundreds of wounded concert goers whose absolute joy in country music that evening was turned into absolute terror, and whose traumatic wounds, both emotional and physical, continue to heal. Here we recognize that for many of the 22,000 in attendance that evening, complete healing may never come. But as the families have a, built a beautiful healing garden just a few miles away, a refuge where they can find some comfort and solace in the company of others as they remember their lost loved ones. We believe the community of Las Vegas, survivors, first responders, and compassionate visitors to the city will find this memorial on the site of the tragedy also to be a place of healing and consoling beauty. By anchoring the memorial in the site of this atrocity, we hope the memory of those lost and injured that evening will move all who visit to nurture love and kindness toward others. We believe in the power of memory to mend broken hearts. We believe in the power of memory to mend a broken world. By that, that will woke you up. Okay, sorry, thank you. First, we wanna thank all of you who shared your stories, your emotions, your feelings, your poems, your songs, your thoughts with us. This human connection has been a very important and inspirational part of our memorial design. Remembrance, respect, honor, healing, unity, peace, community, and love. These values have emerged from the Clark County engagement with stakeholders. And we hope that our memorial embodies these values. We built on the engagement that Clark County started in a very personal way, starting in January with small meetings in person, as well as virtual one-on-one -on -one conversation with family members, Route 91 survivors, 
first responders, emergency responders, medical personnel, and the Las Vegas community. We also engaged in listening and conversations with creative expression artists. We engaged a diverse community by sharing our survey questionnaire and our social media assets, both in English and Spanish, so anyone can share via their social platforms and networks. We were able to reach over a thousand individuals using these tools. This is our tapestry of words. These are excerpts from the many conversations and from the questionnaire responses that have guided us through the memorial design process. Well, this is not actually showing correctly, but this is our diagram of um, the created, that we created to express the 58 angels at the heart of a broader community of support and love. Um, in addition to the inspiration that we got from the conversations with all of you, um, we also drew inspiration from the character of the site, and in particular, the dialogue between the very unique dialogue between the city of Las Vegas and the natural regional character surrounding it. In response, we wanted to create um, what we call a winged pavilion, um, something that could hold its own in the context of the adjacent strip and the city. Um, but on its own terms, um, not, not to outdo the spectacle right next door, but really to have its own quiet, powerful dignity, to create a reverence space um, at a scale that recognizes um, its long sight, as well as uh, the magnitude of the impact of this tragedy and the aftermath. Um, it is set in a natural setting um, of native planting, which Chris will talk about later. And we have at the corner um, a beacon of light 91 feet tall with six strings of light to mark the site vertically as a counterpoint to the horizontal pavilion. What generates the form are the angel wings. Um, these celebrate the spiritual freedom of those 58. It is grounded in the sacred spot where they died. And the plaza continues up the sides. And this pavilion emerges out of the site um, both uh, upward and outward in its gesture, as well as cradling the stories and the names within in a, in a safe place. That form is repeated 58 times as wings and also creates gateways and galleries in continuity with those 58 that are the heart of the memorial. This shows the unity of our approach. Um, it shows the gateway on the left, the galleries to the right, the 58 wings in the center surrounded by landscaped plazas. And um, as a family member and survivor said, being together is strength. Um, this unity of elements creates the power and the strength of this memorial, just as the community. Um, 
it is um, an important uh, value, we think, and an important quality of the monument and the memorial, and expresses what's important about how this community has come together in strength. Country strong, Vegas strong. We also want to evoke a peaceful experience. Um, in this case, um, lifting up to the sky from within. And through remembrance of names and stories within those wings, um, we want to recognize how woven together all of the lives of the 58 and everybody impacted by this um, is, is expressed through the weaving of light and shadow and the form of these wings. And at the, at the far end of this, uh, really what has been called a procession, um, there are the stories uh, not only of what occurred that night, prior to that night, and after that night, um, but there are uh, all of the stories available of the 58, of survivors, um, of responders. Um, this is where people can be educated. Um, it is integrated into the memorial as the place of narrative. Um, we call it our stories gallery. The inspiration for the lighting of the memorial uh, comes from the uh, community lights, uh, both in terms of memorial services and votive candles, as well as during concerts. So uh, we call this the community of lights. There's over 22,000 lights in the floor of the plaza that illuminate the pavilion, as well as the surrounding walls, uh, which illuminate the gardens, as well as project out towards the city. Those lights are meant to give a soft glow to the memorial. Uh, again, not to outcompete the lights on the strip nearby, but to give a fairly reverent quality, as well as uh, illuminate the interior, both where the exhibits are, as, where, as well as the commemorative names. And then this column of light has six light strings uh, that marks the corner. It's a beacon. Um, it references the guitar, as do other elements, uh, which will be discussed in a minute. So looking at the um, narrative of the visitor experience, uh, we'll start at the beginning. <clears throat> this is really one element of a network of facilities, the Resilience Center, the Healing Garden, other facilities as well. So it needs to be looked at in that context of a network of people. The site organization um, has an entry plaza, a gateway pause. The majority of the memorial is devoted to the 58 angels, of course, the dedication the stories gallery and action gallery, and then the, uh, the seasonal garden at the end. I think the one thing I want to underscore is that when you look at this, you may think it's a linear progression, but it's actually very permeable. Uh, it allows people to move in and out of the, the spine of the structure to some of the sanctuary spaces that are adjacent to it. In terms of the stories um, I just mentioned before, they're organized in this fashion. Uh, this is really looking primarily at the kind of weighting of each of those stories. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, the angels were actually the largest portion, as, as you can see here with the elevation below, and that the, the stories are kind of compressed at the end of the exhibit 
as an optional experience that people can go and see if they wish to. Um, the ground plane of the um, entire memorial is activated. That's a important thing uh, to us too. So we start obviously at the beginning of the um, entry plaza with donor recognition that's embedded into the um, plaza there, uh, that they are an important part of this uh, process. Um, we go to the kind of entry uh, plaza with the Vegas uh, strong statement. And then even though it's truncated in this diagram, each of the angels get their own space um, and a ground plane with a guitar pick and some embedded footprints as well as their name that I'll talk about later. And then as we go down into the uh, stories uh, gallery, we'll look at each of those chapters of the event. Uh, again, um, placing those in context. This is just looking at those uh, bronze inlays, specifically the country strong um, bronze inlay that uh, is at the entry to the facility. Now we created a uh, gateway pause because obviously people are coming from all over, you know, by Uber or transit or however. Um, but this gateway pause, you can see this mosaic here. It's a, a mosaic of a, a, a large heart. It's composed of uh, 58 red hearts, the 400 plus blue hearts of the people that were injured and then the surrounding kind of luminous community around it. It's a mosaic that's actually embedded into the concrete wing. Very tactile, very luminous, and in a sense a kind of uh, depiction of the event. You can see it here. And then on the opposing wall, um, actually I go back uh, to that. Um, there, there you see the beginning of the angel uh, colonnade. And, and one thing I wanna say here about the material is that it's a very tactile material. The names are raised so that you can kind of touch them and feel them. There's a small kind of locket um, there available so you can see that as well. We can do media overlays, things like uh, very specific to each of the, the wings a kind of uh, description of the um, individual that's elaborated with on the phone, if you should wish it. Um, it's not necessary at all. <clears throat> After you leave the, uh, the 58 uh, angels, you come to a dedication. And because this is a two-sided embracing uh, space, one side remembers the people who succumbed to the injuries that happened after it, and the other is honoring the first responders, uh, those who are both professionals as well as the volunteers. We think that that's a kind of fitting kind of uh, uh, point after the angel's story that you've kind of passed through. And again, you can see that there's quite a bit of space so that you can kind of enter and exit at any point you wish. Uh, here we're looking at the stories gallery. It's a relatively, in the kind of realm of this, uh, I think an appropriate scale, it's about a thousand square feet, but it can sequentially tell the story very efficiently. All the display cases and monitors are turned on in this depiction, but we can actually half mirror them so that they can be turned off or curated were actually visible in a very kind of narrow uh, perspective. So that uh, those who wish to see the stories can and those who wish not to can kind of bypass. And again, you see some of the openings that are beyond here. In terms of the stories, I, I think what we wanna do is start the sequence with the uh, Route 91 Harvest Festival. We want that to be an immersive experience. Those 
monitors uh, will be uh, around you, kind of surrounding you. Uh, there could be options to hear very localized music and so forth. And then we would go to the tragedy itself, and here we could have a screen where you could literally interact with the screen and touch an individual's uh, face, and then it would evolve into the story about them. These are easy technologies to maintain and kind of keep going, and it's a relatively small space to do so. And then uh, we want to talk about the response, and, and that response is both the, the volunteer response as well as the professional response that happened. And again, that would be kind of a more organized display showing the kind of uh, help that happened uh, thereafter. And then the next chapter would be, of course, the survivors. And, and this is a broad story about uh, not only what happened immediately with the healing garden and other activities, but also kind of moving forward from that uh, to today. And then um, again, you have an option to kind of uh, move off to the side into to garden spaces, but we do want to um, have an open-ended uh, uh, part to this uh, story, which is basically a call to action where people can use uh, these interactive monitors to leave their impressions about the memorial itself, give their thoughts about uh, how we can move forward from it. And um, so it, it's kind of a looking forward, open-ended um, uh, part to the memorial. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, who will talk a little bit about the landscape and how the stories continue there. Thank you. Uh, the landscape's really rooted in, in the Mojave. I know we've heard that before tonight, but it really is of, of paramount importance uh, that that landscape need to be reflective of the region. Uh, it needs to use flora that's both water conserving and xeric. Uh, but also contributes to the overall aesthetic of the memorial. It really should be sculptural in form and sustainable in our, in our harsh environment. I want to speak a little bit about the, uh, the entry plaza. This is a view of the north end of the site. The plaza greets visitors with large evergreen trees that shade the area, along with oversized flat top seating boulders. The shaded boulders really offer visitors a, a beautiful perspective and introduction to the angel wing form. Uh, additional plaza space allows for programmed events and as was mentioned, space for donor pavers. We look to utilize symbolism in the landscape at the memorial. Nature inspired symbolism incorporates living elements such as trees, shrubs, and ground covers to represent the concepts of life, growth, dormancy, renewal, and eternity. Close-up images of the featured Palo Verde tree detail the sculptural trunk forms and their unique adaptations to life in the desert. Profusion of yellow flowers in the springtime will put on a beautiful display against the wing pavilion. These trees provide filtered and dappled shade for the comfort of visitors beneath. The memory fields are situated parallel to the wing pavilion and the Palo Verde tree LA and symbolize the unity of festival victims and attendees. Simple grouped plantings of these kinetic plants foster more contemplative and reflective environment this is a view of the central plaza and seating. In this image, we see the central plaza and ribbon seat wall in the foreground. You can see the carefully aligned relationships between the double allay of Palo Verdes and the individual winged forms. These trees reinforce the processional quality of the memorial 
provide shaded seating just steps away from the colonnade. The sandstone seat wall weaves through these trees, creating a sense of enclosure and protection. I'd like to take a moment and describe the carefully curated site materials which complement the landscape to really create a cohesive design approach. The wing pavilion is contemplated to have a softly, a soft and lightly etched cementitious surface. The ribbon seat wall and sunken garden walls are proposed to have local windswept metacortsite sandstone. We propose the use of durable light colored limestones on the ground plane and portions of the angel wing as well. While regionally acquired rock mulches provide a visual thread that connect throughout the site. All these materials foster a tactile and sensory driven experience. The seasonal garden is situated at the south end of the site. Once visitors have made their way through the wing pavilion and exhibit area, the seasonal garden greets them in a slightly sunken outdoor garden room. The seasonal garden offers a grounded and recentering experience. While this park-like space can accommodate programmed activities, it also allows visitors to decompress and step away from the pavilion. Visitors can sit under the shade of trees and observe the ever-present wildlife, hummingbirds, lizards, butterflies, and all the action in the garden. Within the seasonal garden, blooming plants symbolize life at its peak and vitality and provide vibrant seasonal displays. The varied plant forms, flower colors, and leaf tex textures also symbolize the diversity of humanity as a whole and create an ever-changing landscape. This final view of the seasonal garden depicts the general location of the memorial within the greater urban context. Indicates the park setting for the pavilion with its tree LAs, buffers, and sunken nature of the seasonal garden space with sandstone walls wrapped around like an embrace. We'd like to uh, just end with um, a quiet, reflective video. Um, without any words. Thank you.
I want to thank you all for being here tonight. It's been a long afternoon and evening, and it's been a very wonderful afternoon and evening. Um, all five of the teams, thank you so much from Clark County. It was truly amazing to see all of the thoughtful and careful. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, so much thought and care and concern and, and love was put into each of these designs and I think we all could see that and feel that and so I appreciate all of you and the efforts that you've put in. I wanna thank all of you who joined us tonight, those in the room, thank you so much. Uh, those on Facebook and YouTube and the website and CCTV, thank you so very much for joining us. I do want to share that there are more opportunities uh, for input by the community. And let me put this on so I can see. We do have one more survey, and it's a short, short survey that will be available as of uh, now. And that will run through the, um, the, the end of June, the 29th of June, and that information is going to be included into the overall um, scoring matrix, so you have that opportunity. The concepts here at the, um, the uh, government center that are in the rotunda will be up through most of the summer. So if you have not had a chance and you live in the area or will be coming to the area, please do plan to stop by and take a look. It's great to see. Uh, coming up to um, July 25th, the One October Committee will be meeting again to take all of the scoring that has been done and recommend uh, the top two firms to the Board of County Commissioners at their September 5th meeting. So that's kind of our upcoming timeline. Again, I wanna thank you all. I um, appreciate your involvement. And uh, that does conclude our presentation. Thank you. <laughs>